This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It's three minutes after ten. A very good morning to you. I hope you're okay. Um, We dive straight back into the situation in the Middle East, into the uh, uh, bombardment now of the Gaza Strip in retaliation. Respond. Well, there it is. There's the topic, really. Is it retaliation or response? And it will now be um, civilian casualties and civilian deaths that climb at an exponential rate. Just pause for a moment to reflect upon the scale of the invasion, the, the, the massacre undertaken by Hamas. Israeli authorities have reported 1,500 bodies of Hamas fighters uh, found in Israel. So that, that is an absolute bare minimum of the uh, uh, terrorists who managed to get into one of the most protected territories in the history of humanity, I I think it's fair to say. I don't understand the technicalities of of somehow almost glitching the Iron Dome so that missiles got through as as, as they hadn't before. But the barbarism, of course, was most evident in in the individual encounters, of which more details have emerged since we last spoke yesterday. And they are... I I don't know why we use the word medieval when we're describing barbarism. It's not as if it went out of fashion for six or seven hundred years, is it? There were terrible things going on all over the world long after the medieval ages. But we do, don't we? We we use it as a sort of synonym for um, a, a, a kind of level of violence that we think is unfamiliar or alien. It isn't. It isn't, but but the whether it's the children or the young women being carted off on motorbikes and paraded through territory, I don't know. Um, but another thing we don't know, and I hope that some people with perhaps we took some calls yesterday from Israel itself. I hope some more people listening in Israel will help me out with one side of this conversation today, because I, I, I'm seeing a lot of criticism. Haaretz, which is a big Israeli newspaper. Um, uh, very, very critical of Netanyahu, of, of Benjamin Netanyahu. We, we had a guest yesterday from the Royal United Services Institute who pointed out that whenever a... And listen, I'm, I'm just a human being using words, all right? So if I was about to use the word incursion, and as soon as I felt the word incursion forming in the back of my mind, I thought that's not quite the right word. This is, for me at least, uncharted territory. I, I, I've, I've covered terrorist attacks that were self-contained. I haven't covered atrocities with a tail as long as this one will have in, in anything like the, uh, or at anything like the level that, that we will have to do with this one. So in, invasion rather than incursion. But uh, previous instances of, of comparable behaviour have always seen the head of the government fall, uh, he explained to us yesterday. But Netanyahu is a... It's a different character, isn't he? He's a, it's a sort of unprecedented leader of Israel. And it, it is being suggested in some quarters that arrogance or, or um, obsession with other issues may have contributed to the lack of vigilance that saw this astonishing invasion um, uh, in circumstances that literally nobody foresaw. William Haig writes rather um, impressively in The Times today about the... That about that specifically, about the absolute, um, again, I feel the word, I hear the word success forming in the back of my mind, but that feels like the wrong word to use, doesn't it? Let me just read you what he wrote. To pull off such a feat. See what I mean? Feat, achievement, success. It, it, uh, but it was, from their point of view, I suppose, a successful attack. To pull off such a feat will have required absolute secrecy among a tiny leadership group giving last-minute orders to their followers and working only by word of mouth. But here is the line that I was alluding to a moment ago. It also needed complacency and distraction in Israel's leadership. So complacency and distraction in Israel's leadership. I think you'd struggle to describe that as responsibility for the attacks but again we're on that thin line between explanation and excuse if you want to understand how it happened in the way that it happened then you would have to accommodate what William Haig describes as complacency and distraction in Israel's leadership he also warns against the dangers of Israel falling into a trap that Hamas has set and And that is the bit that we're going to talk about today. It's one analysis. I think he's a former shadow foreign secretary, isn't he, Haig? 
maybe but anyway the point is he, he is a an astute observer of international relations and somebody who would once have been close to a position of major influence on our role in these sort of matters and, and i've chosen him as our entry point because well, I, I found his analysis persuasive, but I also found the questions he both asks and answers quite chilling. So why launch an indiscriminate assault on a vastly superior military power? Why expose the two million Palestinians in the crowded space of Gaza to Israel inevitably trying to crush Hamas and restore order? Why, as well as murdering hundreds of defenceless young people at a rave, parade dead bodies as evidence of the atrocities um, these are the questions that can be answered need to be answered will be answered in days just over a couple of days uh, and weeks the bigger questions of how this happened that could take years that, that will be um, the focus of soul searching and inquiries for years to come but the answer William Hague offers up and it's a it's a fairly straightforward um, answer is that the objective of Hamas is uncontrolled rage. Is uncontrolled rage. Um, and, and that is something that Haig suggests would be a mistake. It is to make Israel lash out in a way that starts a conflagration, to start a war so intense that it spreads, igniting an explosion of violence in the West Bank, bringing in Hezbollah from Lebanon in the north. There's already signs of that happening, exposing Israel to fighting on multiple fronts. You will then see so many Palestinians killed that the Israelis lose the moral high ground of defending themselves against mass murder. And that I think, is the area that interests me most this morning. The, the, the point at which Israel would lose the moral high ground, the difference between retribution and response. Um, Foreign Secretary, of course he was, thank you, Mark, between 2010 and 2014. That, that, that is fascinating and important and arguably has ramifications way beyond the Middle East. There's also, of course, I mean, and the reason why it is a priority for Hamas to do this, to do to do the big picture response, to seek this sort of apocalyptic conflict is because they want to stop this creeping collaboration between Israel and Arab states. Uh, you know, the, the, the sort of normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi and, and, and some other countries. You then use the hostages with maximum cruelty to create a sort of frenzy of hatred on both sides. And... 11 minutes after 10 is the time. And, and the language of Netanyahu is, is very much of a piece with this notion of, of a frenzy of hatred on both sides, uncontrolled rage in Israel's response. I think Haig's right, but I don't know what the alternative is. I don't know what Israel's response should be that we could um, reasonably describe as well what what would be too much oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three so this line between i i Haig puts it very well when he simply talks about losing the moral high ground I, I guess you would count almost civilian deaths wouldn't you but if you can prove that civilian deaths are occurring in pursuit of terrorists then you have a different moral proposition from civilian deaths for, 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 for no sort of uh, uh, grander motive. I, d I just don't know. I, I mean, the three words we used yesterday, and they were the right words to use, and, and thank you for all your kind words about the, um, uh, uh, man the way that we managed to navigate. Tamar's call, which opened proceedings yesterday. I, I, was, at a, um, I was at a funeral yesterday, actually, after the programme. I'll tell you a little more about the wonderful man that we said goodbye to later in the programme, but people were coming up to me at, at a funeral uh, the, the, the wake afterwards to talk about that call, people who'd heard it. And people who'd heard, I, I, one woman I met whose cousin was here from Israel had, had listened to it in the taxi on the way into town from the airport um, and, and, and been absolutely hypnotized by, by that contribution. If you didn't listen to it, you really should have done. So thank you for that. And yesterday, those three words um, that, that, that we focused on were correct, unthinkable, unjustifiable, indefensible. 
And I said to you yesterday, today is not the day for asking bigger questions. And today is not the day for challenging any of those descriptions, Un unthinkable, indefensible, unjustifiable. That's describing the actions of Hamas, the actions of the terrorists. But when would Israel's actions become unjustifiable? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know that when William Hague talks about deliberately provoking Israel to a position where they cede the moral high ground in this case is probably Hamas's plan. They want uncontrolled rage. And, and yet, I don't really see, I don't really see what else Israel can do. 10.14 is the time. 03456060973 is the number that you need. Um, and, and listen, there, there are people, there were some, you need to be careful, particularly when right-wing media in this country gets an opportunity to sort of use the word leftist as a, as a synonym for Hamas support. I think Keir Starmer's made it clear that the Labour Party is categorically no longer an organisation to which that accusation can be levelled, but it won't stop the Daily Mail and others from doing it. A lot of the protests in London were in support of and defence of Palestinian people. If someone is protesting solidarity with Palestinian people, they are not protesting support for Hamas. You, you have to be morally corrupt or deeply, deeply dishonest to, to, to conflate the two. Let's be absolutely clear about that. You show me someone celebrating Hamas, is atrocities, and it did happen, and, and there, there is footage of it, but it's a, a relatively negligible number of people. David Aranovich is, is very strong on this, currently on Twitter, but no doubt shortly on his blog as well. But that, there's a big difference between that and expressing enormous compassion and sympathy for the two million civilians who are now facing the wrath of Israel, the wrath of, of, of an Israeli government that is bloodied and embarrassed, bloodied and humiliated. And that's the point, isn't it? That's the point about uncontrolled rage. It's, so it's, 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 it's the casualties and the deaths. It's the grief and the bereavement and the horror. But for politicians, there's humiliation here. There's humiliation at home. And somehow... This is where diplomacy and the international community and even, I suppose, in a small way, journalism, this is where th th those phenomena become, in a way, checks and balances. Nobody is going to say that Israel, to use a biblical analogy, nobody is going to say that Israel should turn the other cheek on this occasion. But equally, what does an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth look like? What, what would parity look like? What would a reasonable response look like? How much is too much? At what point does Israel, in the specific context of this terror attack, reach a point where a truly fair-minded and objective observer would say that you or she has now gone too far? I have no clue. Sorry, sometimes when I start talking to you at three minutes after ten... I get towards the question that we're going to wrestle with together by around uh, about quarter past, a little later usually, and I, and I feel a little answer or, or the beginnings of an answer to that question beginning to form in my own mind. I thought I would or I hoped that I would today, but I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue. I recommend that you read um, Haig's piece in The Times. And I recommend, if you can, that you, you, you have a look at the Haaretz website for uh, just a reminder for those of us over here of what some Israeli media looks like, because it doesn't look very like our right-wing media in this country. Be, be deeply, deeply aware of the difference between expressing compassion and solidarity for Palestinian civilians and expressing support for acts of terrorism. I, I mean, I... It's tragic that I have to point that out, but I can tell from my inbox already that I do. In fact, speaking of my inbox, first text, top text in, just the, the most recent text to land simply says what Israel needs to do exactly to do is to turn the other cheek. And in a way, you're right. But we both know that's never going to happen. We both know that's never going to happen. So how much is too much? Where should this response end? Where should it reach? Where should it end? And I'll tell you something for nothing. Nobody knows. 
I'm not going to start channeling Don, Donald Rumsfeld, but nobody knows whether Hezbollah, I suppose Hezbollah leaders might, but nobody knows whether Israel's going to be fighting on two fronts. Nobody knows what impact this is going to have. Nobody knows for sure what this will do to the creeping collaboration between Israel and Arab states. But what Hamas wants to do is essentially bring down the ceiling on the whole region, including themselves and the people for whom they claim they are fighting. Those are William Hague's words, not mine. And I think to understand that, you need to understand the, the, the mentality of a suicide bomber almost, whether they're expecting heavenly rewards or, or, or whether they are just caught up in, in their own earthly status. I don't know. But without constant conflict, there is no Hamas. It's, it's what they exist for. If someone once said to me, well, I think it was you actually, you said to me that if, uh, <clears throat> if, if Hamas stops fighting, there's peace. If Israel stops fighting, they get obliterated. I, I, it might be a little simplistic, but I find it helpful. 10.19 is the time. The phone lines are open. The question is simple. The answers will not be. How much is too much? What, where would you draw the line between response and retribution? where retribution is not moral, but response clearly is. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. It's just coming up to 20 past 10. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 22 minutes after 10. I, I, I mean, I don't know how much of the footage you've seen. People with family in Israel are, are, are obviously watching it a, a lot more closely and... Um, in a lot more detail than the rest of us. A, a friend of mine who flew back earlier this week, uh, she was celebrating her dad's birthday in, in, in Israel, is watching a particularly traumatic piece of footage where a girl in her early 20s come, came on air pleading for help as her father was taken hostage to Gaza whilst trying to protect her mother and grandmother, and she can now watch him handcuffed in his underpants being paraded up and down the streets of Gaza on social media. I mention this because this line in Haig's piece about them deliberately trying to provoke the, 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 the most apocalyptic response. It throws all your sort of tanky attempts to bring false equivalence or what aboutery to this into complete disarray. I, I mean, generally, we're talking about a constituency of contributors to British discourse who are too stupid to understand some of the problems that they, they face. Um, it doesn't stop their sort of uh, arrogant certainties. But Hamas parading people deliberately up and down the street, that, that is designed to provoke an even more violent response than Israel might be currently minded to undertake. That seems to me to be crucial to understanding the bigger picture. So I, I accept that on a day like today, I need to wade through millions of texts telling me that Israel has never had the moral high ground and people managing to excuse the events of this weekend without realizing that that's what they're doing. I get that. That's fine. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ugly enough and old enough to to deal with that. But you, 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 you've got to look at what they're doing. It's not just the massacre of young people, that the indiscriminate murder of young people, it's the deliberate aftermath, the, the, the humiliations, the paradings, hostage takings, not just as human shield, but as deliberate attempts to unleash uncontrolled rage. And the more uncontrolled the rage is, the thesis that we're exploring today, the, 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 the more fragile Israel's claim to any right of uh, or any access to moral high ground becomes. It's horrible, right? It's absolutely horrible, which is why I don't know what the answer to any of the questions I've asked is. And you need to remind me on days like today that if you don't have a really, really good answer to the question, I'm not allowed to get impatient with you like I sometimes do on on phones. Let's go to Mark, who's in Reading. Mark, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. And um, thank you for taking my call. Very and um, I, I think the first thing I wanted to say is I think William Hague is is right yes. on this and that's quite a rare thing for me to say <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> but um i think his um analysis that a massive part of this is 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 in order to provoke a response i think people need to really really think on that because my my answer to your question is is admittedly an incredibly naive and idealistic one. Sure. But what I think 
for from now on, from bearing in mind everything that's happened, I think the best thing the Israeli government could do for its people is to say, we're going to be targeted about this. We're not going to, you know, lash out in an indiscriminate way um, because something heinous has been done to our people. We're going to, and unfortunately it will take a long time, but we've, uh, you know, Israel has, has got one of the best security services in the world. Um, I'm sure they would have the support of other Western security services if they needed it. And they said, we will take the time to, in a targeted way, go after the people that have done this to us. Wouldn't that, to, to an Israeli, and indeed to, to, to many observers, wouldn't that just sound like business as usual? Um, I don't think it would be business in, uh, as usual in terms of the immediate aftermath. I think that would look very different from what I, as an observer, and what I think most people in the region would expect Israel to normally do, which is what's already started happening with the the, the shelling of yes. um, of Gaza. I think a pause and a saying, no one's getting away with this, but we're going to do it in a measured way. Um, and hopefully alongside that, there can be, again, with the support of the international community, there can be moves towards actually resolving this rather than continuing that's the cycle. Why, that's why I use the phrase business as usual. So, so it, you know, it, I understand the point that you're making, but this, this, this terror attack mm. wouldn't really change anything from one perspective, would it? Because you, you, you're simply going after people who were already leaders of Hamas, or, albeit that, that, you know, the, the urgency perhaps of that pursuit has changed as a consequence of the terror attack, but the identity of the individuals hasn't. And, and if I was a grieving Israeli, I, I'd be like, why should I trust these people to get the, get the culprits when, they, when the culprits got the better of us on Saturday, on such a, such a grim scale? A really, really good point. Uh, and I would hope that... Um with 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 all the expertise that Israel has, and even though they yeah, they have absolutely been point. caught out, right? Yes, yes. You would hope that given the time, they could they could get the people, some of the people, to show that this isn't going to go unpunished. But we're going to move forward in a different way now. And and, and as I you know, I probably came to the point quite late. It's got to be alongside. How yes, do we sort with out some the sort of problem? international coalition and and, and, yeah. and, and and pursue. Well, that will be interesting, won't it? When they talk about complacency and distraction in Israel's leadership in in recent months, if if not years, that that um, has been the opposite direction of traffic from from the one they undertake. And on that question, actually, of indiscriminate was a word Mark used. A confusion yesterday with from the Israeli government at one point urging Ga people in Gaza to cross into Egypt over, the, I think it's called the Rafa crossing, R-A-F-A-H, um, and then withdrawing the information. It was open when we gave the advice, seemed to be the sort of state of play yesterday evening, but it's closed now. I don't fully understand that either. It gets, it gets horribly overlooked in a lot of the... So again, you know, I, I understand why people queue up to condemn I I Israel, even on days like today, even at times like this. Um, but the, 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 the refusal of Egypt to open that crossing from, from the Gaza Strip is something that, that, again, these people often seem too stupid to understand the relevance or the importance of. But, but yeah, I'm glad Mark's introduced the word indiscriminate into the conversation, and I guess that underpins all the questions that I'm asking. Well, what, what does discriminate response look like as opposed to indiscriminate? And if you're telling civilians, whether it's a permanent piece of advice or a temporary one, you're telling civilians to get out and then admitting later in the day that they can't. Just think for a moment about what that says. You, you've got to get out. Why? Well, because otherwise you could get killed, even though you're blameless. Okay. I can't get out. The crossing's closed now. And the people who told me to get out are the people that are going to be... Do you, do you, so there it is, right, in a single nutshell, in, in two different releases from the same government department, an illustration of what's at stake here, an illustration of what, what William Hague and many, many others are talking about when they describe this as a trap set by Hamas into which Israel currently, currently seems set to run headlong. It is half past ten. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. 10.34 is the time. You, you've got to help me be patient on days like today, not least because I haven't got answers to most of the questions that I'm asking, but also because I keep forgetting about um, catch-up. So uh, you, you, you heard the last words I said before the news about the uh, the Rafa crossing from Gaza into Egypt and, and the relevance of that, and indeed the the, the, the the rather chilling nature of yesterday's announcement that it, Gazans, Palestinians in Gaza should use it to get into Egypt, or almost or else, you know, there's a sort of silent or else at the end of that information, and then having to retract the instruction later in the day because the crossing was closed. Um, and, and then this is the text at the top of my inbox. The only way to, uh, I beg your pardon, we are not mentioning that Egypt also has a border with Gaza. Egypt could have opened up. Other Arab neighbours could have opened up for people to get out. That's literally the last thing I said, but I appreciate lots of people listening on Catch Up these days. It's, it's, it's almost as if time, time itself is being broken by technology. Uh, 10.35 is the time. Gabriella is in Mill Hill. Gabriella, what would you like to say? Hi, um, I am obviously British and I have just left um, Israel. We managed to get out yesterday. Um, De- what, sister, de- de- deliberately? Or, or were you scheduled to come home anyway? We were actually, we were scheduled to come home. Actually, this right. is quite an interesting point. We were scheduled to come home anyway yesterday. All our flights were cancelled. We had to, this is one actual important thing Turkey. to talk about because there are many British citizens who have stuck there yes. now. British Airways basically are only sort of taking crew home as opposed to, I mean, they will, they will run those flights taking people out, but they're not actually putting on very helpful flights. They cancelled our flight. They cancelled my parents' flight. Yes. Um, Did you come via Turkey? Did... Chaos. No, we actually, we were booked to come via Prague. We booked it last minute. We've okay. got two small children. We booked to come via Prague. We got to the airport. We got to the front of this ridiculous, as you can imagine, security line. And then when we got to the front, they told us our flight had been cancelled five minutes beforehand. Whoa, okay. And then, luckily, and I would actually advise it to anyone who's listening who has any family who are stuck in Israel right now, um, the only way we could get out is actually just being physically at the airport and speaking to people at the El Al, which is the Israeli airline desk, and and telling them, basically, get us onto any flight getting with any on, any, any plane that's taking we off, we, we want to be on flight, it. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I was told yesterday that, 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 that Turkey was, was one of the destinations to which planes I mean, are still I think flying. people are going absolutely anywhere. I think people are going to Dubai, to the US, like going to all sorts of places you, you can even imagine just to get home, or even out, as opposed to home, if that makes sense. Indeed it does. What, what, what would you like to say? What made you pick up the so, phone? Um, what made me pick up the phone is I, I heard the caller who was just on recently talking about how Israel should have a sort of targeted response. And, and it was almost like he didn't want to say it because it's, it's so hard to sort of um, mm. even clarify what a targeted response would even look like. Um, and I think one thing I want to say as a Jewish person and as a British person is it's very hard for us as Brits to understand what a targeted response would even look like. Yes. I think what people here need to understand is is Gaza, the Gaza Strip is run by Hamas. Hamas are using civilians as shields. They put them in, in they put rocket launchers in hospitals, in mosques. It is impossible. And, and I'm not, you know, this is not even going against what this man has said. I appreciate that that sounds like a rational sort of reaction. But how do you target now, how do you effectively target this, this overpopulated place where they have rocket launchers from every which way? They have Hamas terrorists hiding in tunnels. Ha- I mean, it's, I mean, clearly this was a huge security error on the Israeli side, but they, they don't know. I don't think they know how to use a targeted response. I don't think they, they are still making so what's the alternative? The to leave. There, I don't think there is an alternative apart from warning people to get out of buildings as they currently are from, you know, buildings where they know that there are civilians saying you've got an hour to get out and we're going to bomb it. That's the only way I think right now they're going to do it. It's unpleasant. It's horrific. I hate seeing pictures of girls and children suffering. I also hate the fact that they've got no hospitals and no proper no proper sort of resources because Hamas has spent all their money on rockets and terror no tunnels. No prospect of getting right. out either. I mean, I, you know, to, no a prospect completely, of getting out. to a completely... But then again, like you said about Egypt... You know, yes, what, yeah, but that's you know, they don't want they don't want them either because do they want their country infiltrated by Hamas? Probably not really. No, I, I think I presume that's a large part of the rationale. I mean, the problem is that the 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 the, the young people and I think the population of of um, Gaza that's under eighteen is, is is among the highest in the world. The young people who are currently not radicalized. <laughs> 
who rush out of those buildings shortly before the bombs drop. And also, if the warning comes and they in... See, and it's increasing the cycle of violence. But, but, I, I, well, I see it. They're tomorrow's terrorists or tomorrow's freedom 100%. fighters, as they would describe themselves. But, but also, with the warnings in place, should, what, what, why wouldn't the terrorists leave the buildings as well? You're making an excellent point. I don't have any answers to those sorts of questions. It's quite an I'm, important I, My one. point was just more hit, more about... Um, and I guess, look, this is why I think a ground invasion is inevitable, because they know that they're hiding in all sorts of bases. They'd rather have their children killed than, than to give up, you know, Hamas leadership bases. It's, and, and also, there's right. another issue, which is obviously there's so many hostages in there that the airstrikes are clearly not going to be the long-term situation here. Like, there must, there is going to be a ground invasion in, in the next few days, and it's not going to help the situation, you know, long term. It's going to be awful. But, but nothing is going to help the situation. They, what can they do? I don't know. That's, I, 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 I promised I wouldn't get That's impatient with people for not being able to answer the question. But <laughs> I, 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 having I mean, just having just been in Israel, I think the collective shock and grief of this nation, where where in terms of the numbers of people, elderly women, children, women who've been raped. I mean, it's so unbelievable and so brutal. And everyone knows someone who knows someone who's been kidnapped. I mean, what sort of, can you even imagine that happening in the UK? So, so talking about tolerance and restraint, that word restraint is, is an interesting one because what does that even mean? I think you're the, first, you're the first person to use that word today on this program at least. It's interesting because I've seen it quite a lot on social media where people saying we hope that Israel can but, act with but, restraint. But you're saying you that, imagine but them saying that Ga- Gabriella, you, I, I, listen I understand everything you're saying and, I, and, I, and you're right, I can only imagine the emotional investment that, that, that you and many others have, but but you are saying in terms that because of the appalling atrocities inflicted upon completely innocent people by Hamas, there should be no restraint in inflicting atrocities on completely innocent people by Israel. I didn't say there should be no restraint. I said but you objected to the use like? of the word restraint. Because it's an impossible thing to quantify. And I think you can agree with that. Well, it isn't, though, is it? You've just quantified it. You've just described the atrocities. You've used incredibly powerful and accurate language about rape and torture and parading people through the streets. I don't think Israelis who who are doing airstrikes are thinking of this necessarily. And I'm sure many are. I'm sure there are many people who have been, you know, directly affected in the South, for example, yes. who look at this and they are thinking probably an eye for an eye. I completely yes. see that. Or two so eyes for an eye, the majority of Israelis <laughs> who are who are very left-leaning, just are thinking, how can we flatten Hamas? How mm. can we completely get rid of Cut all that out. infrastructure? And, and there is no real answer. Look, let's face it. Well, this is when we're back to no where we started. Idea. We're back to where we this started because you, you, you take out the, the, the modern iteration of Hamas and they're back tomorrow with, with either different identity, different individuals under a different Kabbalah, name. I don't know. I don't know. Kabbalah Nobody Kabbalah. knows. As per the last caller, when he spoke about a more targeted response, I do think a ground invasion is going to provide that more targeted response. It's going to be appalling. And then the death toll of the response. death toll of completely innocent people heads ever upwards, doesn't it? Oh, and the death toll of of Israeli soldiers will be enormous. It, it is a massive sacrifice. But what has just happened? They need to prevent it from happening again. Here, it is here's awful. the well. There it is. What does success look like? Well, there's this, as far as I can see it, it's already been a victory for Hamas. So there's no, but, not going to be any success. But the response, what does the success of the response look like? I think everyone is viewing success in a different way. So BB well, so I'm asking you. Not being removed. For success, it's to sort of make sure that the borders are more secure. It is absolutely not about ensuring that we don't have another generation of hate because we're going to get that anyway. I really think the damage has already been done over years and years of this. On both sides? And yeah, yeah, on both sides, on both sides. But I will say that one thing we're not taking into account is, is the, the music festival that was made. Most mm. of the people there were, were, pe- were pacifists. Yes, I know. I mean, and, and actually the kids, and just this morning, the stories that are coming out, because obviously they've been sort of very, very slow to hit mainstream media, and they've sort of been circulated as people looking for family members. Yes, it reminds me a bit of 9-11. Is, is, you know, whole families being taken and people seeing them on the back of sort of cattle trucks being paraded through Gaza. I, I don't, I, I'm not saying that this is going to solve anything. I don't think there's going to be any good sort of long-term outcome here. 
No, uh, I, I, I don't think there is either. And in Israel is even, it, it feels very united right now. They don't even really care about, it, about whether they get sort of the international sign-off here. They're going to do whatever they can to protect their people. Uh, and, and yet, and yet as, 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 as if we've established anything in this conversation, it, 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 the, I mean, protecting the, the, the people is, is, is close to nebulous and almost certainly impossible in, in any long-term meaningful way. So that's why I asked what success will look like. And, and quite a few people reminding me and you, Gabriella, of the, the, the old phrase that an eye for an eye makes everyone blind, which I, I feels, I mean, simplistic, but oddly appropriate. It's quarter to 11. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.48 is the time, and um, I, again, this this seems to be pretty apposite to me. The paradox is that both sides believe that only more deaths will bring peace, and it's an unshakable belief based on their own existence. Um, and, and there is some truth in the notion that even people who are not either in Hamas or in the IDF think that actions are, are justified by events, justified by circumstances, but... Um, I don't know where the line is. I, I know that it, it's, I mean, you've got the Geneva Convention, you've got international law, you've got United Nations, you, you've even got right back to St. Augustine asking questions about what, what is a just war? Can there be such a thing as a just war? But, you know, if civilians are, are being killed, then the moral dimension at the moment just seems to be the celebratory element of it, the, the, the parading through streets, the relish as opposed to perhaps seeing it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an unpleasant duty. But the death is the same. The death doesn't change according to the, the mood or the motivation of the killer, does it? Um, just something Gabriella said that a few of you have picked up on. I, I'm not sure it's ever been um, uh, established that Hamas keep uh, fire rockets from, uh, from, from mosques and or schools. The, the, the most recent report I could find is 10 years old. And uh, it, 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 it involves... Well, the Israelis kept saying rockets were fired from schools or hospitals when in fact they were fired two or three hundred metres away. Still, there were some mistakes made and they were quickly dealt with. That, that's a spokesman to, speaking to the Associated Press ten years ago. But it's the first acknowledgement that, uh, by a Hamas official that in some cases rockets had been fired um, from near residential areas or civilian facilities. That, that's the only reference to it I could find. But this struck me. This is a paragraph, and uh, just to stress, perhaps, the, the, the intractability of it all. This is almost exactly 10 years old. This is from September 2014, but it could be from today or tomorrow. The questions lie at the heart of a brewing international legal confrontation. Did Hamas deliberately and systematically fire rockets at Israel from homes, hospitals, and schools in the hope that Israel would be deterred from retaliating, as Israel claims, or did Israel use force excessively, resulting in deaths among people not involved in combat operations and and that i think might be brutal though it is the question that underpins all of the next few days um the question of of, of uh, deaths among people not involved in combat operations the response to deaths among people not involved in combat operations will be more deaths among people not involved in combat operations i listen i know that's how wars work but it sounds mad doesn't it when you put it in those uh those sort of terms. How are we going to respond to the deaths among people not involved in combat operations? We're going to respond with more deaths among people not involved in combat operations. And the likelihood of any sort of meaningful resolution seems to me to be highly unlikely, although I will bite your arm off if you can offer up a more optimistic analysis. Mark's in Bristol. Mark, what would you like to say? Okay, well, you nailed it, James. Um, just to give you a little background, uh, I am a British citizen, British Israeli citizen. I was a paratrooper a hundred years ago in the Israeli <laughs> army. I've been in, I've been in situations like this. Gosh. I also, just to give the other side, I also co-founded with three musicians from Gaza in 1998, the first Palestinian Israeli music band ever. I think definitely wow. a rock and roll band. <laughs> Um, called White Flag, and that name was given by one of the Palestinians, I may add, the yes. name White Flag to the band. There is no resolution in what's going to go on. Uh, the angst and the anger and the fear and the hate is, 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 of course, driving emotions now in Israel, led by a government who's totally ineffectual, which is the scariest thing of all. In my opinion, the central most scary issue is that we have a bunch of very incompetent people, including people in positions of security leadership who have never actually served a day in their lives in armies in Israel. Um, 
if it was possible to pinpoint and take out the Hamas, I would support that. Yes. Um, I'm not some like deep pacifist who's like, we shouldn't respond. Uh, it's not going to happen. I was speaking to one of my co-band mates from Gaza. He's not in Gaza anymore. He managed to get asylum in another country. I'm right. not going to say any names because oh, there are people there still from my band. And I have my nephew sitting in troops around the border of Gaza right now. So Gosh. I'm truly stuck between a stone and a hard place because yes. I know people everywhere. Yes. This is going to be, there is going to be no um, solution and no destroying of the Hamas. As my friend told me last night, there's a city under a city in Gaza. They have tunnels and secret spaces, which is going to be impossible to get to. Um, how do you deal with it? The, as, there is, of course, only one solution. This is going to sound fantastically naive and stupid. The world has allowed, sadly, Israel, who I want to make clear to all those people who are screaming and saying you're a traitorous Israeli right now. Um, the world years ago should have like imposed uh, kind of a, 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 not sanctions or whatever the word should be on Israel to get out of the occupied territories, of course, because we've created a, an impossible situation yeah. in the Middle East. And uh, but the tragedy, let's go back to what is what is uh, a reasonable response well, you know, people dying, innocent people on any level is is not a reasonable response because innocent people are going to die. So, you know, the bottom line is, do we legitimize killing to a certain point or where do we draw the line? Well, that's and it. I, and I, as you were saying before, and there is nobody has the answer to this. And when emotions are high, of course, um, you know, and I'm sitting here, I'm feeling uh -huh. my blood pumping down my are. body, being emotional yes. and trying to be be sensible. So... There is only one solution, which is a long-term solution, which demands international uh, intervention. The fear of, like, you know, uh, if you're anti, or if you call out Israel, equated to anti-Semitism is, is an extraordinarily complicated international issue. Now and and, largely, un and uh, largely unhelpful, I think. Because oh, completely it, unhelpful. You know, the, you particularly know. at the moment, the critiques of the current government from within Israel are, are, are both loud and detailed, and, and I think you'd, you'd be part of that process. Can I ask you a question re relevant yeah. to that point? Which, which is, yeah. and, and listen, this will be pure opinion. Nobody knows what, what, what the future holds, but you obviously follow events more closely than I do, it, it, inevitably. How much, how fearful are you that Netanyahu's response will be informed by the sense of, of, of humiliation and shame, that he will not be a acting in a, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of, he'll be less sensible than he would have been if this attack, this incursion, this invasion had not been so embarrassing for him. Do you, do you, see, do you see what I mean? How can yeah, he, se how, 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 how fearful are you that he will not be able to separate the personal humiliation from the military response? He's not going to be able at all. We no. only have to watch his behavior over the last 10 years. Listen, this is a guy who's been in power, give or take, since 2009. He had a, a year's break here and there yeah. to go and recuperate yeah. and get his ducks in a row again. Um, this is, you have to understand, there's a basic thing that many people don't understand about Israel. There's a word in Hebrew which is called bitchonis. Bitchonis comes from the word bitchon, which means security. There are, Israel is fundamentally, on, as, a, as a, a community, quite a center-left, socially uh, aware nation. Sadly, the situation in Israel and many legitimate reasons to fear, the, you know, for their personal security and their survival, and, and this is absolutely true, has allowed many people who would normally vote left and center to vote right because they believe, like in the UK, we tend to believe the conservatives are better with money yes. than the left. The equation is in Israel that the right wing have got the uh, 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 kind of got the defense. what's the word? Yeah, they're, they're, they've got defence down better than the left wing. Um, even though I may add that the, the well, both the, of those the, both of those are under threat this week, aren't they? Both of those positions, the British one and the Israeli one. Well, there you go. Yeah. So, so weirdly, um, I'm, I you know I know quite a lot about British politics, but mm. I don't want to go there. But weirdly, if you look at the great successes, and I may add the old failure, like the Yom Kippur, the October yes. War, exactly 50 years ago, the greatest victories were left by people who were generals leading, you know, who then became prime ministers like Rabin. So they were left. So yes. once again, we, you know, 
there, there is a contradiction in the truth and and the and the uh, and the story that's told. But the sad thing, let's get back to the issue. Well, we're going to run. We're going to run out of time, so you'll need to be brief now, Mark. Right. So, sadly, the bottom line is they will not be able to destroy Hamas. But there will so be blood. But oh, there will be terrible blood. And that the question is, where does that leave us as far as the real, real politic, real politics? Well, I don't like know. Say, and the future of Israel. Nor do I. Back to but there back is to only one solution. I'll finish with this. Yeah, go on. What is it? You've got to. There is only one solution, which is world. Um, you know, people, world powers coming along and say to Israel, until you start dealing with the peace issue in the West Bank and the occupation, this is going to go on and on and on. And we have to start moving into another. So the road, we can't let them get away with the traffic. The direction then would be towards uh, 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 um, enshrining Palestinian statehood in some sense or not. In some sense or another. And how that would express itself is, you know, not people. Well, I don't know wiser than me. I don't see many, but people who in theory are wiser than me. Um, coming up with solutions, but this is this is just going to, and it can conflate the whole region, and that undoubtedly is and what's that, pushing. There it is. They and, want and Iran and the Hezbollah on and to they come in. The well, that's the phrase, isn't it, about provoking yeah. uncontrolled rage? And and uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. J- just to clarify for people tuning in, perhaps halfway through your call, you 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 you've served in the Israeli army yourself. You've served in the Israeli. Defense. I was a paratrooper. Uh, yeah, it's kind of Thank weird you. to be a musician and a paratrooper. There you go. <laughs> I don't, maybe there should be more of that, Mark. And the world would be a, I don't know, a different place. It's coming up to ten fifty nine. Um, once again, I. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by the quality of contribution to the program today and, and the, the nature of this conversation is such that no, there's not going to be anything close to consensus but that, that except perhaps in the area of futility but if it was your house into which someone had just marched and and uh, you know behaved abominably you, you would not consider every response to be futile you'd consider some responses to be both necessary and inevitable it's coming up to 11 o'clock you're listening to james o'brien on lbc and we'll continue this conversation from um, a number of perspectives but but chiefly (laughs) how do you define a reasonable response in the context of civilian death i'm not sure you can actually James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11 is the time. And if, if you think these some of the uh, issues we're tackling are big, uh, try this one on for size from Gary. And this is a, 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 a widely expressed view as well. Um, my fear is that Israel, with the support of Saudi Arabia, will now target Iran. There's all so much at play, so much at play. Just on a, on a lighter note, two texts that arrived within moments of each other. This one um, referencing Mark, our last caller. James, that caller you had on just before the news is one of the most balanced, conscious contributions I've ever heard um, towards this conversation, which was nice. And um, at the same time, uh, exactly the same time, actually, looking at the timestamp, uh, John texted, why don't you shut up? <laughs> so you can't please, <laughs> they said you can't please all of the people all of the time. I think we provide conclusive and irrefutable proof of that on a daily basis. Um, a quick mention of something domestic. Uh, obviously, the Labour Party conference in Liverpool is underway. I find it very hard to tear my attention away from events in the Middle East because they are so horrible and because they have potentially such astonishing reverberations and ramifications. But, but, um, but we, we, we must try in the course of the week and possibly in the course of the day. Um, But the most remarkable thing has happened with regard to Rishi Sunak's speech last week. Uh, Do you remember that long list of announcements that he made about where money saved by cancelling HS2 from Manchester to Birmingham would instead be spent? Do you remember that? I think you could call it a central platform of his entire conference speech, couldn't you, reasonably? Well, they weren't announcements at all. There, 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 there was no intention of delivering them. I mean, some of them had already been announced before. Some of them, and not for the first time, I find myself wondering what this story would look like if we didn't have a print media that is 80% uh, sycophantic towards the Tory party, who's ever ch- whoever is in charge, and, and a broadcast media that is either uh, uh, part of the problem or uh, kind of tied to the... 
uh, medium tied to the way that the newspapers still sadly set so much of the agenda for everybody else from, you know, newspaper reviews on uh, on BBC programmes right through to me relying on newspapers to decide what I'm going to talk about in the morning. We, we managed to plough our own furrow, but the agenda, we are seagulls, not trawlers, I think, most days. But imagine if you had a, a, a print media, imagine if you had four newspapers that were either broadly uh, impartial, broadly independent, or lent slightly towards the Labour Party at the moment. How do you think the fact that the long list of announcements that Rishi Sunak made in his speech has been disowned after it emerged that some of the stuff had already been announced and um, and, and some of it was already in place not just already announced some of it already existed i think there was a link in manchester to the airport was it i forget the precise details the announced been there for about five years but what what it has subsequently been established that these were illustrative ideas for projects that quotes could be funded so when he stood up and made a, that long list of things he was going to spend the hs2 money on they weren't actually things that he's going to spend the HS2 money on. They were things that he could spend the HS2 money on. They were sort of illustrative. Well, I don't say sort of. That's the word that's been used, illustrative. Victoria Derbyshire completely barbecued that absolute oaf Mark Harper, the transport secretary, on the telly on Sunday morning. And um, and and he described it as a, he, we gave some examples about the sorts of things that money could be spent on. And she did something I have been waiting the best part of a decade for BBC journalists to do. She pulled the document out of her hat, not literally, and said to him, no, they were not illustrations. These are announcements. I've got the document here. Some of the stuff you've announced has already happened. Some of it has already been announced. And all of it, according to Mark Harper, was not actually an announcement at all. It was merely an illustration of the sort of thing that we might actually spend the money on. So if you are living according to Rishi Sunak's moral compass and you're at work today, you don't actually have to do anything. If it's your job, perhaps, to, I don't know, take the bins out, all seven of them, you don't have to. You're taking the bins out. It's just an illustration of the kind of thing that you might do if you turn up for work today. So what are you going to do? You're going to make a speech at 10 o'clock when you get into the office or you get into the shop, and you're going to make a long list of all the things that you... Are you going to say, these are all the things I'm going to do today? And when the boss comes to check on you at three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon and, and, and she says quite rightly, you haven't done this and you haven't done that. You've not done the numbers. You haven't done your sales figures. You haven't restocked the bathrooms. You haven't put the shirts out on the shelves. You haven't audited the sales for last set. And you said, no, 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 no. When I said that I was going to do these things today... I simply offered up illustrations of the kind of things I could do today if I wanted to. And now, I, sorry, when I said I was actually going to do these things, all of these things, I did not mean to give the impression that I was actually going to do all of these things when I said that I was going to do all of these things. I was merely offering up uh, some illustrative ideas of, of things that could be done today by me. So what, uh, what have you done? Nothing, mate, boss sir madam nothing at all i've done that nothing nothing that's that's where we are now i I'm, i haven't plugged my book for a while so i will now because this is absolutely crucial to the thesis of my new book how they broke britain the way that reality itself has been completely broken completely broken so a prime minister a prime minister remember not only have you got people like mark harper engaging in sort of far-right conspiracy theories about 15 minute cities and what have you but an actual prime minister who promised professionalism accountability and integrity can stand up in front of an actual tory conference and announce a list of actual promises Actual destinations for money saved by cancelling the link between Manchester and Birmingham on HS2. And then within days, not months or years, it's not like Johnson's hospitals, the 40 hospitals that never be, will never be built or were never actually going to be new hospitals at all. It's not like that where it takes months or years for the truth to emerge. Within days, this long list of announcements has been rendered... Um, has been rendered redundant they, because they were not announcements at all. They were illustrative ideas for projects that could be funded, not necessarily projects that would receive any funding. I think that's incredible, frankly. I, I think we're living in the, uh, what's it called in the Stranger Things, the Upside Down. I think we're living in the Upside Down. You express this kind of madness from, from populists and 
and and chances like Farage, but but like hecklers, you can heckle this kind of crud from the back of the room. You can't be on the actual stage peddling it. But there we are. There we are. Ten minutes after eleven is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Back from domestic politics, although we will catch up with some of the events in Liverpool today shortly, and back to international politics and the kind of international politics, of course, that can have um, astonishing ramifications around the world. Paul in Manchester makes an excellent point about these comparisons with 9-11, which I understand, uh, and, and even with Pearl Harbor. But 9-11 in particular surely provides the world, says says Paul, with a masterclass in how not to respond to a terrorist attack. Uh, he's kind of got a point, hasn't he? And yet here we are. Hassan is in Leeds. Hassan, what would you like to say? Hi there. Good morning, James. Hello, okay. mate. Very yeah, good. What's I, on your mind? I, I, I only felt... I only felt compelled to actually ring in just because you sounded so well-meaning in yesterday's monologue. And I just hope you don't mind if I slightly push back on some of the points and hopefully you can understand I mean, I, 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 different perspective. No, of course was, I will. And I, and I will listen, but this is today's show. Oh, sorry. No, it was just, it was just more on um, the point about this notion that you can't contextualise such atrocities basically but that's um, yesterday's program okay and does, is it not relevant to today with regards well, to it, it, it is but you're, you're, i mean i've got no way of knowing how many people listening now would have been listening yesterday okay but you can um, i mean like you're here now and i don't, I don't want to sound rude so but by all means contribute to yesterday's program today okay my apologies that's um, all right, mate. well just just on the point that you, you know if we can't contextualize as, 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 you know, as harrowing or as horrific as, as, as um, the, situ the, the situation and, event and how events have unfolded, we can't really learn and take heed of past mistakes or past atrocities. So, you know, I used to be a lecturer on Middle East politics. I used to teach the Israel-Palestine dilemma, as I'd call it. I think it's a bit skewed to call it a conflict. Um, so I used to teach my students, for example, if you don't, if you're not, if you aren't able to contextualize for example, the rampant anti-Semitism that took place on the continent in Europe, you can't then, you, you can only then gain an appreciation for why there was a need for this notion of Jewish self-determination. Yes. And then how an ideology like Zionism gains traction, um, benevolent intentioned or not, that's another debate. But the, ultimately, just coming to today with regards to reaction and, and whatnot, that there's two, for me, there's two issues at play. And um, one, ultimately... Um, and I think your last caller actually alluded to it, is that if we are looking, if we, if we, if we are genuinely serious mm. about de-escalating and, 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 you know, beyond the, the, the more understandably emotive and sometimes knee-jerk reactions, which could, of course, exacerbate the problem, is, is ultimately, you know, compliance with international law. And that really, that squarely um, lays uh, ending Israeli impunity. I mean, impunity is really the, the the key word here. Until what, what, what does until we, what, what, what does yeah, punishment look like? Punishment, in yeah, what for, sense, bre for breaches of international law or for breaches of UN resolutions. What what would you like the world to do? Well, we were able to. I mean, if if Amnesty International is now regarding Israel as an apartheid state. I think the most analogous but, example but, uh, would but be that's how not, the that's not international law. I don't listen. I'm not having an argument with you. I'm just steering you away from charities and back to international law and institutions. Well, well with regards to if 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 it is recognised that Israel in this context is is um, is committing several international war crimes in this respect and crimes against humanity, Pot which the practice of the practice of apartheid is. Well, hang on. I, I, this, this was it was oh, only through okay. it was only through ending South Africa's impunity were we able to hold them to account and end apartheid in that country. But for you some mean reason, through sanctions? There's, there's something, there's something you mean extremely... through sanctions? I, listen, I need to pin down what you're saying, Hassan. Do you, do you mean through sanctions? Yeah, through sanctions, okay. through the cultural boycott, the very thing that people, you know, the activists who have been calling for has been, you know, through through BDS, for example has been regarded as somehow being somehow discriminatory, but it's, you know, if... if, if so it's if, a form if it's of... Not it's, that, it's, if it's not through non-violent means. Well, it's a form, exactly, it's a form of non-military collective punishment. 
Well, this is the, but that, that, that's how that's how South, apartheid South Africa came to an end. I no, the, 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 that's, the that, that's, that's, a, been, that's a very arguable that's a very arguable position. But but let's pretend it's completely copper bottomed. It doesn't change the fact that you are advocating for non-military collective punishment. I'm not for one. I mean, having taught Middle East politics, I'm not one. I don't, I don't take any glee from from utilizing. No, it's sanctions. not. It's not a trick question. It just that is what you're calling for, and of course, it then, it, it then, depends then, upon. Look, it depends but, upon. Okay, I mean, I thought this might expect, happen. I thought this is, might happen, and it was very, it was very good of you to, to to establish at the start that you weren't really contributing to any of the conversations that we're having today. But let let me try and steer you briefly because we're short of time. How how would imposing sanctions on Israel help people in Gaza? Because it would, it, because because what other way when you've got an Israeli cabinet? No, that's like a question. Today, that's a question. I do I'm, I'm, I do need I'm, an answer. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to answer the question. My, the point is, is that well, what what other solution have we got? That's a question. How do we? Well, that's what another other means question. Have, I'm, I'm I'm answering it through a rhetorical question. Well, I don't want to so, rhetor. I want to know how it will help the people in Gaza. It'll help the people in Gaza because th- we need some we need some way of holding Israel to account. But how will it help the people in Gaza? Because it may it may deter Israel from maintaining occupation and the besiegement of a people that are illegally occupied. So which comes on to my other point. So no, hang on. That, no, let's Go examine on. that properly. Let's unpack that. So putting sanctions on Israel with reference to Gaza would make them do what exactly? Bring bring down the the wall. Well, it may it may it may it may, it, it may actually create some form of pressure on, on on Israel's part to actually revise and and have a realistic approach to coming towards a two uh, well not a two state solution which I believe is dead and buried which you know uh, but I, a one I, state I, reality I am I am, I am out of time and I don't, I don't want you to feel uh, un, un, unfairly hurried but I just want you to put into words precisely what you think and and may or might happen in the context of the blockade between Israel and Gaza, sanctions upon Israel would prompt Israel to take down this blockade. Is that is that what you're saying? I'm not. I'm genuinely confused. I'm just saying there needs to be some form of political political pressure internationally. Yes, Maybe not so, but that's not an answer to the question of how it would help the people. You can say, well, it wouldn't help the people of Gaza at all, but it would make me feel better. It's not, but, but helping the pe- helping the people of helping the people. And maintaining the status quo isn't helping the people of Gaza. No, which is why I'm asking how your proposal to change the status quo would. Because because Israel feels emboldened because it has impunity on the international stage. Yes, so, so it's we going keep, to level Gaza that, to the but ground. But but the, but the sanctions in terms of helping the people of Gaza. Maybe I've gone down a rabbit hole, Hassan. Well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not look, sure. But look, didn't okay. But didn't international pressure end apartheid rule in South Africa or in, not? Was there in, nothing international to be said pre- there? international pressure did, and I, I've allowed I've allowed your use of the word apartheid to, and, and indeed your mention of. Amnesty International um, uh, using it too, but it's 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 far from established with the same certainty that it was in South Africa in apartheid. On the contrary, I mean, you've got people like Desmond Tutu who say that the situation in Israel Palestine is even worse than South Africa. Yes, exactly. But but in Israel, you don't have people who are as clear about this description as as you are and Desmond Tutu is. So I, I'm not necessarily rejecting your use of language. I'm just pointing out that it is. It's the difference between an opinion and a, and a unanimous recognition, which is what you had in South Africa. Nobody in South Africa denied the existence okay. of apartheid. Millions okay. of people, you, millions okay. of people in Israel do. So do you recognise that the Palestinians are an occupied people? Is that an established fact well, in your mind? Well, the Palestinian people were, and also you're jumping around now like a jelly bean. It's, I mean, we're having a conversation about how sanctions are going to help the people in Gaza. We're having the conversation about your use of the word apartheid, which I had to correctly challenge and point out that you were being a little bit disingenuous, and that's fine. And, and now you're having a conversation about what I understand the word occupied to mean, and I don't know where you're even talking well, about. Well, it, well, where's the, start? But, 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 is the what, starting point? And is, how is, is any of this... And how is any of this relevant to the conversation we're having today about what is likely to happen next? As I'm saying, the problem at the heart of it, instead of just resorting to emotive knee-jerk responses, is that we need to have compliance with international law. Until that comes into being... <laughs> but we're talking about a terrorist it. attack, mate. But that's, but that's your framing. Oh, international law... Okay, so you think, that, you think that was, that, was, that was within international no, no. law? 
By international law, it's the occupied who have the right to self-defense. Israel is the occupier. Are we, so you're now the describing the events of this weekend as self-defense? I'm not saying that. I'm so why did you bring the I phrase don't. into this conversation then? No, because because we keep hearing this mantra that Israel has the right to defend itself. No, but not from me. Not, 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 not for, again, you're having a Western, conversation independently of what everybody else is talking about. Why did I'm you bring... Saying, I'm saying that's what we're Western talking about policy. the events of this weekend and we're talking about Israel's current and likely response. You've talked a lot about international law, so I merely pointed out that what happened this weekend is categorically in breach of every imaginable law. And yet you started no, talking about... Look, as, as, as harrowing as it, as it is... Go on. The thing is, God... And I'll make... Honestly... The, the, I'm very, the, very late for the break now. I think I've given okay, you plenty but, of time. But but go on, just give me a sentence but, on why... But until... But, but, the, but occupied people, by international law, have the right to self-defend But why have you now, mentioned now, that? Why have you mentioned now, that in the context of this weekend? In the context... Well, you, you, you're wanting to understand why such atrocities happen, don't you? Or no, you just, we're, 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 I mean, again, you know, you phoned in to talk about my opening to yesterday's programme. Today's show is entirely yeah, about because, Israel's because response to the to, terrorist attack, and I don't understand why you've used the word self-defence <laughs> phrase. No, because the problem, James, is you want to speak about such events in a vacuum. No, I want you are, to tell me why you've talked about self-defence in the context of the last 48 hours, the last 72 hours. That's all. So you... So you, so Gaza is not has not been besieged. For, you're, doing not, it, you're doing it again. It's a very, very simple years. question. What, what, why is self-defence? Why does that phrase have any place in the conversations that I've had now for two days on this program? Because I'm just I'm just bringing up the notion of international law. That's no, no, no. You're not. Is. You're bringing up the notion of self-defence. Don't, don't, don't insult my listeners. They've been listening to this conversation. Why have you brought self-defence into this conversation? Because occupied people have the right to resist using whatever but we're whatever talking about means. okay they so, so you to. think the terrorist attacks this weekend were so acts of self-defense then why didn't you just say so no i'm saying i'm saying right, we're going around in circles now i'm sorry no, Hassan. I'm i've given you every opportunity to explain why you're using the words that you're using and you're refusing to to, to pay me the courtesy of responding honestly no, why I have am, you mentioned self-defense in the context of what happened over the last three days because because we're, we're, we're given this, this assumption, this tacit understanding... Please just answer my Israel. question, please. I, I am answering... Are you question. describing these actions as self-defence? And if you're not, why bring the words into the conversation? I'm saying that any occupied people have the right to okay. respond... I, I think I understand why you're doing that. Um, and I hope you do too. It's 11.23 now. James O'Brien on LBC... <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.26 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm actually glancing at the clock. I'll go straight to the phones because we won't have long before the news. Rosie is in Boreham Wood. Rosie, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Firstly, I want to thank you for your impartiality and journalistic integrity. I know this is a very difficult debate to be having. Um, I was very nervous to call in. Um, I'm a mess to be honest, I oh. uh, haven't slept for three days. Hmm. Um, my daughter is currently a combat soldier serving in the IDF. Um, and as I was sitting, wondering whether to call you or not, I received a text from her to say they'd found the body of her friend. Um, that last night she was messaging me in hope that they were going to find her. Her friend had been kidnapped, had she? Or, or they just didn't um, know where she I'm was? I'm not sure the details. Oh, I'm she sorry. Was and is she a comrade of, of, of your daughter or just a, just like a social just friend, a friend's friend? friend. friend. Okay. Yeah, my daughter was I'm sorry for your loss. Yes. Thank you. Um, so if you can imagine, it's very close to us. Um, something that I've been shouting at the radio for the last few days, in fact, for the last 20 years. <laughs> um, I want to tell you some of the stories that I can tell you of what my daughter tells me. First of all, she serves in the IDF. And she serves with Muslims, she serves with Druze, and she serves with Christians. This is not a fight of Jew against Muslim. This is a fight against right against wrong. Um, yeah, um, I also want to tell you that when she has to guard uh, Palestinian villages, many Palestinians come to her begging for her help. They are terrified of their own police. They are terrified of the corruption. And as an Israeli that lived there for 17 years, I can tell you that the only solution I see to the long-term problem is that the Palestinians get leadership, 
that can lead them in the right direction. The corruption. But, but what do you think the right direction is? Because you know, without okay. without a formal formalized state, what yeah. what would what would they be leading? I would love them to have their own state. I think they could have a wonderful life if they lived as neighbours of Israel. It's a very successful country. And as our other neighbours have, Jordan, Egypt, we could live in peace together. I, I promise you, I'm a settler. I'll, I'll tell everybody that. I lived on the settlements for 17 years. We call them disputed territories, and it's not the time to get into the politics. Well, of that. I don't know that that's fair, actually. After, you know, I was pretty robust with Hassan over his use of the word apartheid, so I think I have to be robust with you over your euphemistic, your euphemistic description of occupied territories. Okay, we can have that discussion. It's a long one to have. Well, and it's quite again, difficult. again, I can't, I can't. I mean, you were very kind in your compliment of my impartiality at the outset. So, yeah. oh, so fair. I can't, that's I fair. can't go after, I can't go after Hassan for using the word apartheid without with less alacrity than I go after you for for um, misrepresenting the occupied territories, Rosie. That's fair. This discussion is had all over Israel every day of between course. left and right. Of course, Everyone but just just for the record, I don't that's accept fine. I don't accept your use of that's those okay. words any more than I accept it. If you want to meet me and have that debate <laughs> when we've got hours to talk about yeah, it okay. because it takes hours, I would be happy to do that. Um, and I respect your opinion. I respect the p- opinions of many people. That what what do you me. think is going to happen next? And, and given that you have your daughter where she is now I, I almost hesitate to ask that question um, we're terrified terrified and I'm terrified for the innocent Palestinians and I'm terrified for the Israelis um, I have family and friends all over the country as you can imagine I have young lads and lasses that are waiting on the borders of Gaza that are fighting now my daughter is there well, she's a girl <laughs> very brave one but she's she's out there fighting and we are terrified um, of the escalation like the whole world and we just want peace uh, as, a, as a settler whether you agree whether it's a settler or a disputed or occupied or whatever mm, that yeah. label it's, it's not that funny. glib though is it come on Rosie I can't I can't what? let you just uh, gloss over it like that but you're right well, we can I'm, do just, that I'm we can do that another time because because we're short of time, time how, I'm saying, how, not how much important. Le, le, I can tell you that I just want to say that living in the settlements for 17 years, occupied territories, if you want to call them that, that's that's what that yeah, label is. That's what they are. Oh, well, I disagree, but we, like well, I say, I this is the time to that conversation. Okay. What I want to say to you is I can tell you from per- first-hand experience that m- most, most um, of the people that were my friends and neighbours want peace, desperately want but, peace. But, but... but. But and I'm so, sure many of the Palestinians want peace. Of course I know they them. do. But, you know, it's astonishing that you and Hassan have come on next to each other because yeah, he, 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 he would see... He would well. see... Like, yes. I, I no, hang on. Just, just He would see your presence in those territories as a yeah. provocation which entitles people to undertake acts of self-defense. And, and, and you're both quite intractable. You know, both civilized, educated, yep. intelligent, charming people, yep. but utterly, utterly intractable and quite possibly incapable of seeing how you are yin to each other's yang. No, you- it's, not, it's not impossible for me to see that at all. I would be happy for we would give up land. I would be happy to move. We did it in Gaza. We moved every single Israeli person that was called a settlement out for peace. And for peace, I would leave my home okay. overnight. I'm not there anymore. I left a few years ago. All right. I and, and can, can I ask you one? F- okay. No, I, I, I respect that. And and I, I, if you if the dog could see the rabbit, so to speak, if you could see that the action would have the consequence that you desired. But I would like to ask you one thing from a personal okay. perspective, and that is. Okay your current attitude towards t- towards the current Israeli government and and, uh, and, and its an role in what's happened in the last few days? That's a big one. Yeah. Very difficult to answer very quickly. Okay, you don't um, have to. Um, it's difficult to put into right. words. I'm hoping and praying that we do the right thing, and the right thing for me is to get rid of this barbaric thing that has been a, an obstruction to peace for so many years. This has not happened overnight. And I just ask one more thing of people. When you, when you talk about Israel, uh, first of all, avoid the propaganda online. There is so much false information out there. And secondly... Well, there's I'm false not, information from, from everywhere. Not, you know, there's lots... Lo- lo- yeah, yeah, I teach that. That's my job. So okay. I know what I'm talking about. Same here. And secondly, <laughs> I would just ask people to look at a map of Israel. It's complex. It's complicated beyond words. And well, I think everyone, if, any, if we can find any areas of unanimous agreement, the idea that it's complicated 
beyond words would would um would indeed be one of those but um but thank you rosie and uh, I, I say again those two calls coming in swift succession have um demonstrated much more than perhaps either caller allowed or or, or or intended or even expected and that that is the position that we find ourselves in just language isn't it self-defense apartheid occupied you can't even agree on what words mean you're never going to agree on anything thomas watts has your headlines James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.37 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, quite a few of you um, picking up on something I just pointed out. This text puts it well. It's, if ever there was a snapshot of how complex it is to find a solution to the situation in Israel and Palestine, it's the two calls that you have just taken in quick succession. You're right. And, you know, as I say to you on many, many, many occasions, I, I can only work with what you give me. And, and thankfully, you generally give me astonishing um, raw material to work with. Daniel is in Stanmore. Daniel, what would you like to say? I just wanted to address your point or the question of what happens next. And it's safe to say that the bombardment will continue and the next phase will have to be a ground invasion. Israel has to root out Hamas and let's call them what they are. They're terrorists. The act on Saturday is it's indescribable and as a Jew in North West London feeling helpless here, it's been an emotion for 72 hours for me. But the simple answer is they're going to have to go in and they're going to have to go house to house if they really want to worm out Hamas. Because there's no other way of restoring deterrence by wiping them out. Now, the issue is... But, the, 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 I mean, deterrence don't work, do they? If, if we, I mean, if, if the Saturday showed us many, many, this weekend rather, showed us many, many things. But the deterrence aren't going to work. These, these people went into Israel knowing they were going to die. How does, yeah, how, does, how does killing them provide a deterrent? It doesn't. And if anything, it just raises another generation of but these, Palestinians who but, are going to hate Israel for resenting Israel But these, for these are reasons Israel. not to do the things you just told us that Israel needed to do. But there's no other way of dealing with terrorists. Then but you've just said that doing the thing you've called for would create a new generation of terrorists. And that's the moral dilemma. It's, we can't well, it's not it. a moral dilemma. It's, it's, it's night following day. If you don't want a new generation of terrorists, you're going to have to come up with a different plan from the one you've rung into indoors. Well, we've tried to, that in the past with what? talking with them, offering peace. We gave them Gaza. Well, we gave them the whole Gaza Strip. Quite, I mean, it's, okay. Which has been yeah. described by international observers as the largest open prison in the world. It's amazing. They can't get electricity, but they can get weapons. What type of prison is that? Well, it's a, it's a prison where you can carry a gun through a tunnel or over a border, but you can't set up an electricity infrastructure. OK, so let's look at the root of it then. OK. If Hamas... OK, actually, I was thinking about this yesterday, OK? Yeah. If we want to call them freedom fighters... No one's done that what, today. No, I know. No, but I'm so let's have a we, conversation about the stuff that we're talking about, not about completely... Um, okay. disconnected Fine. phenomena. Okay, let's let's keep it real then. If yeah. Hamas really cared about the Palestinians, they would put their arms down and say, okay, let's work towards a peace. And you've, you've got the area of Gaza, you can self-govern there. If you work with the Israelis, they have been in the past dividing. Well, I mean, you know as well as I do that they, they were democratically elected to govern in, I think, 2006, and it was rejected. Yeah. it was rejected by the international community and I think by Israel as well. Well, regardless if it was rejected or not, they are the But that's, that's the, the precedent that they would follow, isn't it? I mean, I'd go, oh, crikey, don't put me in a position of, of trying to imagine what goes on in their heads. But what you've just suggested as a course is a course that has already been closed to them. And, 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 and I have to pick up on the notion of w we gave them Gaza because, you know, the... the 1948 settlements or people removed yeah. from their ancestral homes and and I, I if i were one of them it wouldn't sound like generosity and largesse to me daniel to say oh you can have that 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 bit yeah. there and we'll, we'll we'll pack you all in there but you definitely can't have your Completely ancestral true. home back so uh, you know and that and that point there just shows how complex <laughs> yes it, ex exactly which is why yeah. perhaps ringing in to say we've got to go in and start going door to door and killing people is not uh, going to be a solution to yeah. anything but I think and listen this isn't a criticism at yeah. all but you began by talking about your own emotional situation 
Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it might make you feel better if that happened. That's a good, it's a good way of phrasing it, but I was answering your question in terms of what is next, and that is honestly what is going to have to happen next, whether the outcome is positive or negative. Because it's Yes, but that's why I'm bringing your emotions it. into it, because you, you yeah. think that has to happen next, because that, that will... Okay. That will satisfy your. Well, I can't. Well, I will if no, no, you want. No, but no, but you I'm did bring them. In, you did bring them into it. No, I agree. I'm going to take my emotions out of it. What I would want to happen from a neutral perspective yeah. is Israel to have them in a position where we have to sit down and talk this through in terms of Hamas mediated by Egypt. A conversation about how they can advance peace. And they've done this in the past, after the operations, the countless operations in the past. Now, obviously, we have to think about this is not an operation. This is obviously a war. But also, anything you point as happening in the past, it kind of, w w with the fact that we're having this conversation now, is kind yeah. of proof that it didn't work, isn't it? I know. It's crazy. But I think it comes, it comes down to the point of, if the Palestinians put down their weapons, there'll be peace. If Israel don't put down the weapons, there'll be no Israel. And that yes, I've, I've already too. I've already made that point, and I do understand it. But it's 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 much easier to say from the perspective of the current status quo if you're Israeli as opposed to Palestinian, isn't it? No, of course. That's the problem. I, I mean, and, and actually, one point we never make, and and it, again, it's a little bit simplistic. But a genuinely impartial, independent observer, mm -hmm. do you think they would rather be? Palestinian living in Gaza or Israeli living in Israel? Well, the latter. Yeah, and yet a lot of these conversations are framed as if it were the other way around. For an Israeli living in Gaza? No, no, sorry, Matt, I should have been clearer. It's as if, uh, uh, you know, as if the, the, the threat and the peril that, that people in Israel live under is yeah. comparable to the threat and the peril that people in Gaza live under. When it, well, I mean, statistically, it isn't really. No, if you, if you look at the numbers, then they're, they're skewed, obviously, in the favour of Israelis in terms of less Israelis being killed. Mm. That's a whole, another conversation in terms of bomb shelters and Iron Dome, but yeah. again, that's, it just shows the complexity of it all. It does. But at the end of the day, if Hamas turn around now and say, OK, Israel, let's stop and have... I say that's even stupid because Israel aren't going to turn around and go, OK, fine, you kill a thousand <laughs> of us. We're going to sit down <laughs> You've got that right. But, yeah. It, it's a rock and a hard place for neutrals but also Palestinians and Israelis saying this saying that I think the status quo just suits or benefits well it keeps powers. it keeps it keeps it keeps Netanyahu in power and it keeps Hamas leaders in in power as well and that, that in some I mean the, the, the you know the, the ugliest conclusion to draw sometimes as you I think were just alluding to is that the status quo might be horrible, but other people with, you know, different motivations may consider it to be the least bad of options uh, without some massive change in, in, in position that neither side is, is, is prepared to even contemplate. I, Daniel, thank you for that. I, I appreciate your personal perspective on it and I appreciate your honesty. I really do. But, but the, you know, I, I think what we both discovered during the course of that conversation is that you might have a an urge, uh, an atavistic or an emotional urge for much more robust action in Gaza, but it wouldn't actually achieve anything, certainly not in the long term and probably not in the short term. And of course, if people are prepared to die, as I think almost everyone that went over the border from Gaza into Israel at the weekend was, then tracking people down and killing them is, an, is, a, is going to be an odd sort of deterrent. It's 11.45. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.48 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC where we've had a, a, I mean, a fruitful conversation, an interesting conversation, a fraught and difficult conversation and I'm sure I haven't got everything right in every every minute of it but it, it, it's, it's a bit better for having been had and yet, as I said to you at 10 o'clock yesterday morning, we won't make any progress and we won't uh, really come to a better understanding of why it feels as if more bloodshed will have to happen. Uh, and, and there it is. That's, you know, man hands on misery to man. It deepens like the coastal shelf. Get out as quickly as you can and don't have any kids yourself, as uh, Philip Larkin wrote. 11.49 is the time. Zara is in Leicester. Zara, what would you like to say? Hi. Um, Hello. Well, I've got so much to say. Um, but first of all, I want to just say that I'm really, really sorry 
um, that because of the way that people have behaved and the way that the Jewish people are feeling and they're scared. Equally, um, I want to just say that Muslim people are feeling equally scared. For example, yesterday I had to go somewhere and I didn't take the train or public transport because I've seen the hateful comments online from people, especially the far right, who are really sort of exploiting this situation. Yes. Um, and it's emboldened them. So I'm also equally fearful. And I therefore say it paid only almost £400 to get to the work event that I needed to get to and back yesterday God. out of my own fee because I was scared. So I just wanted to say that, but... It's, a very, it's, an, important, it's an important point. Anyone who's yeah. even glanced at social media will understand exactly where you're yeah. coming from. The far right, they're absolutely... I mean, they're blaming it on Muslims. It's Islamic culture. It's how they're born. It's not they're, just you know, the far right. Well, actually, possibly it is the far right, but it but it fits with the rhetoric of the current yeah. Home Secretary as well, of course, when yeah, talking her, about... her, of course, yeah. and her. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to talk about was dignity. And the problem is that when you dehumanise people and you don't give them their dignity, this is what they become. Now, most people may not have seen um, the things that happen in Palestine. I've seen Syria footage regularly, regularly over the past few years, even just two weeks ago, of the kind of things that the IDF do in Palestine. And it is equally the same as the way that Hamas behaved in Israel this weekend. Absolutely deplorable and disgusting. Uh, two weeks ago... I'm going to push back against the use okay. of the word equally I think you've got you know you've got I no, think, equally deplorable equally deplorable well, disgusting you, okay, well, possibly saying, but just in terms of qu- quantity of carnage as opposed to anything I'm, else I'm not talking about carnage I'm talking about like well, don't, don't let, let, me, let me explain where I'm coming from okay okay so because you use the word equally right okay. and, and that, Im- <laughs> that immediately suggests that what w- what is visited upon Palestinian people is equal to what was visited upon I don't upon mean us. it like that, and you Good, know I, that. I don't know that. I'm <laughs> giving you the opportunity to clarify, because a lot of people listening will have heard the word equally and thought that you were doing okay, equivalent. Okay, let me clarify. Equivalent. What I mean to say, what I mean to say is, like, two weeks ago, the IDF uh, went into a ho- few houses in a neighbourhood, and they forced the women to strip at gunpoint in front of their children. Absolutely strip naked and make them walk around in a circle. They were crying, begging them not to make them do that in front of their children. Older children, boys, husbands, uh, you know, male men in, in the family. Um, that's just one of the examples of the dignity that you know is taken away from Palestinians. And so, of course, you're going to have a generation that grows up with hate and retaliation and behaves the way that Hamas and the men that went into Israel behave. Uh, which is obviously disgusting. Yes. I'm not I just, just again, it, again, not, a... not to contradict you, but just for the benefit of people less yes. informed than you, yes. it was female yes. soldiers, female Israeli defence force. Was it female? Okay, right. Well, you should oh, probably okay. know that before that. you drop I it into the middle that. of my radio show. <laughs> Okay. All right. um, okay, but still, to do that to anyone... Yeah, uh, no, absolutely, me, but it changes that. the picture enormously, yeah. doesn't it, for people yeah. listening? Yeah, but it, it's the way... That's, this is how terrorists are grown. You know, this is how terrorists are basically raised. Um, uh, And I think the only solution, the only solution is um, Netanyahu has been, you know, in his post for a long time. He needs to be removed. The international assembly of the court has said they need to step in and they need to remove Netanyahu. Just we lose. I'm losing your phone line. If you could stand oh, still and just, just. Uh, sorry. I'm outside in a car park. That's all right. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah. So we need to. I think the international community needs to step in and say, look, everything that you've done so far has not worked. We need to bring in new leadership, both in Palestine. I know they've tried that before, and in um, Israel. We need to remove Netanyahu. Well, that's that's a democratic. Head. That's a question of elections, isn't it? Really. No, as in, as in, not even elections. Literally forced, bring someone in, two sides stepped in to have a negotiation, really, really talk about, you know, uh, settlements, talk about uh, releasing their prisoners, because Hamas made it very clear, didn't they, that they have taken these people hostage because they want to negotiate with their prisoners. They want to get, have, um, you know, their female prisoners released, because the IDF have been imprisoning children and women for years, indiscriminately, and they want those people released. Now, you can see that they've used the wrong tactic. Well, I, don't, I haven't seen that yet myself, actually, from oh, Hamas. I did. I did, yeah, I saw that somewhere. I can't remember where, but basically oh, okay. they said... Um, it was in Arab in Arabic, but they basically said that um, they wanted to have their female. Because uh, well, I've seen them say that they'll execute one on live television for every bomb that drops on Gaza. That was 
was yesterday, but the day before that <laughs> was a female prisoner thing. Oh, okay. um, but yes, I also saw that. But yeah, so I think I think the key is literally we need new leadership on both sides, enforced by the international community, zero support and arms sent to Israel, um, and really just and, and, and sort of pacifying in a way and saying, look, we're bringing a new leadership to the table, Hamas. Step back. Let's talk about there, this. But I, don't, I mean, yeah, I, I can't fault that bit of what you've said, but I, I think it's pie in the sky, isn't it? I think yeah, we probably both know be. that. But because the idea... We've got in the so I don't know, the though. Yeah, that this it's a, you need to create a scenario in which peace is an achievable goal, and yet there will be people in both Gaza and Israel who don't think that peace is an achievable goal until their, their enemy is vanquished completely. And that is yeah. almost yeah. certainly a logistical and a physical impossibility. And, and on we go, and, and on we go, and on we go. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's but I, I think at, at the, the, the current situation is not, it's going to, on the ongoing, it's going to breed more resentment, more hate, uh, you know, more freedom fighters or terrorists, whatever you want to call them. It is not well, going to end. Yeah. It's not the way. I, I mean, yeah. in the context of this weekend, I will call them terrorists. Thank you. Yeah, they were. <laughs> they were. Yeah, I mean, what, the way they behave was, and I'd just like to say, un-Islamic. It's yes. disgusting. And it's a shame. They brought shame to the religion. And I know the people that are celebrating, the majority of Muslims that are celebrating Bradford, Birmingham, wherever you've seen them, London. I don't think, personally, I don't know them, mm. but I don't think they're, they're celebrating the, um, the, the, the way that they treated the civilians. I think they're celebrating that they finally got power. They finally showed strength. I think that's what they're celebrating, that they've got a chance of... I think that's what most people are thinking, not the specific details of what they did. And when you look at what they did, it is absolutely shameful shameful honestly and and, and and yeah i mean it's not the way that you're taught if you can't you can't celebrate anybody being you know no true. and and yet Even children uh, and elderly would be told it's one of our laws you can't target them it's one of our laws of war the prophet muhammad told us this and they know this so and i also really question the people that went in and the people that got in mm. with all that surveillance how the hell did they get in <laughs> well, that that like, is that is the question that is going to be. I'm wondering, are they really like? Don't, who don't, are they? Yeah. I don't know who they are. Don't go conspiracy. <laughs> I thought you were going to go conspiracy theory on me there, Zara, for a minute. I don't. Don't go conspiracy theory on me. No, I'm not. But I'm wondering who they are. Well, I mean, I, I mean yeah. that. That yeah. I mean the organisational uh, requirements that must have been in place. And in fact, as as the you know as the days pass, uh, I've seen some reports that there would have been quite senior Hamas people who had. Little idea about what was going to happen. Um, I, I, I'm not. I, I, just, I think it was Oz Katerji who, who's provided us with some astonishing reports from Kiev and follows these events very, very closely. Um, uh, is is posting some fascinating, developing stories. But yes, I mean that will be when the. Uh, I don't want to say when the dust settles because that sounds glib. But the question, as we began at ten o'clock this morning, by saying that it will be um, uh, the subject of inquiries and soul searching for years to come, how Hamas managed to launch a brutal terrorist offensive without any foreknowledge, apparently, inside Israel's formidable intelligence services. Thank you, Zara. I mean, I often think it's ridiculous to ask people to confine their contributions to the time available. Rarely will it ever be more ridiculous than this, Jamie, in Glasgow. But I've got two minutes and you're welcome to as much of them as you want. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually an international law and security um, master's student. And under my kind of studies, I understand that I don't think there has been anything formally agreed, but as per Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and under the Hague 1907 Convention, Article 42 and Article 49 of the Geneva Convention, I would argue that Palestine has been placed under an occupation by the Israeli state. When the ge Convention Geographically, <laughs> when, when you use the word Palestine, what, what are you referring to? So I'm, I'm referring to the Palestinian kind of states that were agreed through the UN, through the two-state party. Um, so, in, in, I mean, for, um, for, for people not clear on, on what that means, what does that mean? Where, so the two, precisely? Oh, so the two-party states, so it's the West Bank and the upper, I think it's Upper East side of the sort of landmass between the two. I think it was kind of described as a sort of X in a way by the UN. Um, that land has been encroached on since then. Under the Hague Convention of 1907, the territory can be considered as under occupation when it's actually placed under the authority of a hostile army. Now, we saw um, throughout 2017 and 2018 
Palestinian people who have work permits to work outside of the occupied area that they are placed in have died because they are placed in cages to try and exit. People, Palestinian people who have work permits to work outside of this area sleep at their work so that they don't have to go through these measures. We also saw in 2018 that Palestinian people tried to negotiate peacefully for an end to the occupation and for peace talks, but thousands were killed. I think this is something that obviously needs to be negotiated internationally, and I think as well states outside of Israel and Palestine need to look at their own historical context. Okay, I did, I did, I did warn you that, that we only had two minutes, so I can only apologise, and 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 also, you know, a, a, a friendly reminder that we do ask fairly specific questions for reasons, for for, for good reason on the programme, largely because there is so much extraneous information and so many other issues that might be pertinent to the to the central question. But if we focus on the central question, we generally make a little bit more progress. But I, I'm not disputing or challenging. Anything that you said, because I, 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 a because I don't want to, and, um, and 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 b because I don't I don't have the knowledge that you have, even if I was minded to do so. It's coming up. Well, it's just gone twelve o'clock actually. Um, I, I think what I'll take away from that was one of the things that happened at the very beginning when you're reading a report from 2014 about the broader ramifications that could frankly have been written today. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 12. This is a, a story that... I mean, do you know the maddest thing, perhaps, about the four hours of conversation that we've had about the um, events in Israel over the weekend and the and the likely aftermath is... I, I could be wrong, but I don't think anyone's mentioned religion. Have they? I don't think... Well, if, I mean, if, if, if we did, it was very briefly alluded to. That just that idea that you have a sort of divine right to pursue whatever course you want to pursue if if, if that just only but it wasn't i mean i don't know that we've done that before we haven't talked about the middle east for quite a long time actually but when we used to r- religion would be central to it and it reminds me of ireland actually it, it reminds me of the troubles and the discovery really at the most cursory study of it that that really i mean sectarianism and and actual religion are quite different things i I just mentioned that because there is a story today in the times about non-religious people having a more positive experience of life and enjoying stronger social networks than those with a deep faith it's not i mean it's it's by gallup which is a reputable polling firm and there are two things about this that I find absolutely fascinating. Some, some of the questions... I'll tell you what they are in a minute. I'll open up the phone lines. Some of the questions include, did you smile or laugh a lot yesterday? Did you learn or do something interesting yesterday? I think we're probably the reason. I think we've skewed the research. I think if you listen to this program, then you'll go, regardless of what your religious affiliations might be, then you're going to be answering yes to all of these questions. Did you smile and laugh a lot yesterday? Yes, I did, particularly between 10 o'clock in the morning and one o'clock in the afternoon okay next question did you learn or do something interesting yesterday yes i did particularly between 10 o'clock in the morning and one o'clock in the afternoon um so th- th- there were two interesting things about this and i'm not sure you're going to believe the second bit the first bit is that in the uk non-religious people apparently have a more positive experience of life and enjoy stronger social networks than those with a deep faith the second bit is, in the rest of the world, it's the other way round. So there are two killer questions here for you. Why do you think non-religious people are happier than people with a deep faith? And then the second question becomes, which I don't think you can answer from a position of personal experience. The second question becomes, why, why is the United Kingdom the, the outlier? This is Brexit. This is exceptionalism. This is, this is a, a apparent evidence that we are, uh, in some deep and meaningful way, different from everybody else. Um, I, that, so that's it. I just, I just want you to reflect on this. And I, and I need your help because, you know, we've been in very deep territory for the last two hours. And this is, 
I hope, a slightly lighter conversation, although you don't often say that about religious issues. So um, the, 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 you, you don't need any particular grounding or understanding of the issues to answer the question of why you think non-religious people have a more positive experience of life and stronger no social networks than people with deep faith, which flies in the face of what my presumptions were. And, and, and yet when I think about my own life, I... Um, I wonder whether I, I, I wonder whether I kind of have some evidence of it. I don't know. I, I I've gone. I guess I was very. I've had a very religious upbringing. That probably did more harm than good. But that was to do with priests, not with religion itself. That that was to do with men who really weren't worthy of the office that they held or the influence that they had over my life. But I always derived enormous, enormous amounts of uh, solace from church, specifically from church. And that just comes and goes throughout my life. When I lost my dad in 2012, I, I found myself going to church a lot. We were already attending, but th that was like the place I'd go to talk to him. So in the immediate aftermath of grief, religion made me happier. But then when I look back on my teenage years and the sort of moral instruction of the Catholic Church putting me in in a state of sinfulness on various occasions, it just added to my stresses. So do I, when, I, when I'm going through periods of faith, am I happier or less happy than when I'm going through periods of little or no faith? I couldn't tell you. Actually, I couldn't tell you. But I want you to tell me why you think non-religious people have a more positive experience of life and enjoy stronger social networks than those with a deep faith. Ideally, I mean, from a position of personal perspective. So you used to have a position of deep faith and now you don't. Why do you think you're happier now than you were then? 0345-6060973. And for the... So is it sociologist? Yeah, Will's just texted Catholic guilt. You're right. And actually, I must... Um, there was a very, very funny text that I must read out. I think I've probably... Here you go. Apologies to Ian. He says, It's bad enough that you ignore all my texts, but saying that nobody mentioned religion, you're trolling me now. So presumably Ian sent me a lot of texts mentioning religion in the context of the conversation we've had over the last four hours. Or, or rather, four hours over the last two days. Um, so I thought I'd read your text out just to prove you wrong on that one, Ian. So that's double trolling now. You can't accuse me of not reading your text out when I'm literally in the process of reading your text out. So if you've, if you've had deep faith in your life and you don't now, can you explain why you think you are happier now than you were then? 0345 Does the thought of heaven play a part in it? The thought of an afterlife? I'd have thought that that was quite an uplifting belief, but possibly... Possibly not. And then you've got the judgment that's attached to a lot of religions. You, you've got an awful lot of um, a, 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 a kind of sense of shame and guilt and all that kind of stuff, which if you are an atheist, if you are non-religious, if you don't believe, then you are free from, from all of that. You are a prisoner only of your conscience, which is generally quite a good thing, because if you haven't got a conscience... You're Boris Johnson. You're a sociopath. There's, uh, there's, there's you know, reasons why mankind created religions and and it is to try and impose order upon chaos to try and create stability and indeed fealty and loyalty within within societies so I, I i find this fascinating they're looking at the devout people in most religious countries reporting an average score for positive experiences of of 67 percent but for non-religious people it goes right down to 58.7 percent so, so how religious a country is becomes part of it, which speaks to the second bit of the question, which is why is the UK an outlier on this? What is it about the United Kingdom in 2023 that means devoutly religious people will be less happy than non-religious people, when in almost all other countries, the opposite holds true? That's really interesting. We could have a think about that. I, I mean, I, I don't think that publicly religious people do give give uh, do religion itself much favours. You know, the kind of people who claim to be devout Christians, while well, they're either insulting poor people or, or, or 
waxing lyrical about food banks. So sort of, well, I'm thinking about conservative politicians, really, who trumpet their Catholicism or their Christianity while punting policies that would have Jesus absolutely apoplectic with disapproval. It would be like the, the money lenders in the temple times times 10. So that could be part of it. That, that might be part of it is why but not when we are becoming a less religious country because people who claim they are religious are so unimpressive, so deeply unimpressive. But why would that make us happier as non-religious people than we would be as religious people? 13 minutes after 12 is the time. Um, Stefan writes, religion in a multicultural society like the UK keeps people and groups apart. Religion in a mainly single cultural society brings everyone together. I know this from experience growing up in Iceland and then living in the UK. That's really interesting. It could be that, that we have, uh, you know, I mean, I get the numbers don't necessarily support Stefan's point, but I guess the question of being devoutly religious does. But lots of people who loosely call themselves Christian would not call themselves devoutly religious so divisions between christians and sikhs and hindus and jews and muslims i don't know I, I, maybe that is something to do with it and Stephen on the isle of dogs quite rightly uh points out i just said religion brings social stability which is not true really when you look at jerusalem at the moment and elsewhere no you know what i mean i didn't say now i meant back in the mists of time Stephen. when when religion look so for example king alfred wouldn't have been able to introduce law really to what has become England if it wasn't for religion. If the churches hadn't already imposed some sort of framework of order, then you wouldn't have been able to get common law out there. And and even today, our judicial system hinges upon Judeo-Christian traditions. Um, so, so, yeah, obviously religion also causes a hell of a lot of problems. Inarguably, I would say more problems than it solves on a global level or a societal level. But the reason why they came into force or the reason why they spread, the reason why Roman a Roman emperor would have embraced Christianity is that, that it, it, you can combine government with evangel evangelism. You can, you can spread messages under the guise of the church that are of benefit to the state. Uh, however, why the UK should be the hotbed of non-religious people being happier than religious people, I do not know. And I can't wait to find out why you think that might be. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The time now is 12.15. The phone lines are open and the questions for once are pretty clear. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.17. Why do you think non-religious people are happier than people with deep faith? Wait for it. And why is that only true in the United Kingdom? 0345 606 Bill's in Wandsworth. Bill, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Pleasure to speak to you again. Well, um, we'll I had to pull over and answer uh, <laughs> um, I think that in a modern Western society like the UK, where most of our needs are met, um, mm. you inquire about some of the things that maybe are accepted at face value. Where I asked your researcher actually which countries are included, and she mentioned some parts of Europe. In Asia, and I, I travel quite a lot to Asia, and you see suffering the difficulties that people in that part of the world are facing in their day to day lives. But yes. we are, we don't have that at all. We have a sort of sophisticated, um, I know our needs aren't all met, any of them are. And I think that we inquire, and again, put my cards on the table. When you start reading about religion, and it doesn't make a lot of sense, really, does it? Or it makes perfect sense. I mean, it, it, it depends on, on your perspective. But I don't think most people described here as non-religious are going to be intellectual atheists who've, who've read a lot into various faiths. I, I wonder, and I don't know whether this was your point or not, Bill, forgive me, but because well, I think it was Marx, wasn't it, who described religion as the opiate of the masses, by which I think he meant that the promise of the afterlife makes you put up with all sorts of nonsense in the actual yeah. life. And yeah, you're exactly saying that, that and you're yeah. saying I think you're saying the better your actual life, the less attractive the promise of the afterlife becomes. So you're going to be less religious if 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 life's okay. I think I think there's some truth in that. And also we're fairly cynical in the UK, I think. If there's such a thing as a as a, as a national sort trait. of trait, there is a, a degree of 
cynicism uh, and a an, uh, refusal to take everything at face value, possibly, where countries like America, which is quite insular in many ways, and I've travelled there a lot as well, they kind of don't ask the same questions that perhaps we ask. Well, and we're generalising a bit, but I take your central are, point. But it doesn't answer the question, why would a deeply religious person here in the United Kingdom yeah. be less happy well, than a non-religious well, person? Well, because I think as well that as a, I mean, as a, as you call me intellectual atheist, I read too much Christopher Hitchens, clearly. Yes. Um, I'm not sure a, it's possible to read too much Christopher Hitchens. No, I agree. I think, yeah, incredible, uh, incredible um, uh, person. But I think I don't judge others and I don't fear being judged. So you I think die. that so they might fear being judged, and that would make them yeah, less happy. Absolutely. But it usually yeah, cuts I, the other way. So, I, so yeah, I take it. I mean, I, I get very personal perspective, which is welcome, and indeed what I asked for. I, I, and, and that idea of because we can't get inside the heads of other people. Why would you have been less happy when you were religious if if you'd been on that kind of yeah. journey? I think as, as as Hitchens talks about this this golden rule that you treat others as you treat you know you want to be treated yourself. I mean that's the way. I would treat people. I would try and be respectful and polite and kind as much as possible in my day-to-day life. Uh, so I don't, you know... Eat. Not, not, not because Christians, you feel you have to, not because you're being instructed to, but because you just want to. I, I, there is a difference there. I often, when I b- b- dived into these sort of issues from a perspective of my own faith, I got quite a lot of people got upset with me for, for, for suggesting that religion makes you behave well. And it c- categorically, as Bill points out quite perfectly, it's a stupid suggestion. It maybe compels people who wouldn't naturally behave well to behave a bit better out of fear of retribution. But that's kind of being good under duress as opposed to doing good for good's sake. So, you know, an act of charity is is probably more pure if there's no expectation of reward for the person doing it, than it is if you're thinking you're going to get your reward in heaven. Becky's in Kenilworth. Becky, what would you like to say? Hiya. Um, uh, so I think, um, so for transparency, I think your producer asked me to mention that I was on a different LBC show yesterday talking about um, Palestine and Israel. So um, that, that's by the by, but I just thought I'd mention it just in case. Um, but yeah, on this, um, on this issue, I think one of the key things is that community, uh, which is a key aspect of, many different faiths has almost um speaking from my perspective as a christian who's grown up in the church and seen many different changes i think that's um not necessarily a key part of of religion anymore and i think that might be due to the fact of demographics changing in churches it's probably having a more aging population um and so with with that with the early church being based on community um as part of their faith i think the two things have become separate and now non-religious people might find stronger social connections and more ha- and happiness because they're able to find you know in a in an age of greater tolerance obviously it's not perfect but greater tolerance for differences kind of like differences in sexuality gender identity um there's more tools now oh. online and 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 in and in different parts of life to so find you mean a sense of belonging you mean a sense of belonging which yeah. we, we, we we might once have derived from church and now we don't need to yeah, and um, and you know, and speaking as someone, and speaking as someone who's kind of changed it, um, changed churches over over the years, according. Oh, an act of God there! So, an intervention, a divine intervention, to prevent Becky from completing that contribution to the program. We may never know what it was going to be. Twenty-three minutes after twelve. What do you think the time limit is on that? Because you can tell, can't you, when a line's gone. The worst thing is if someone is breathing in or pausing naturally and the line goes down then, that puts me in a very tricky situation. I, 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 I sometimes think you could get caught in an eternal vortex. Are you there, Becky? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I mean, that's that's quite a religious question in itself, isn't oh, it? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so, um, um, so I, I don't know when I got cut off before, but, um, but people might have, like you said, people might have derived a sense of belonging in the church, but due to, you know, say someone who's, um, who's exploring their gender identity, they might not feel welcome in a church, but they'll find other forms of community where yeah, they might I mean, feel... I don't know that, that, that the examples we're exploring here would provide enough heft statistically to change to change the overall picture. But I, I, I like the way it, it kind of portrays the UK's position in a positive light. It's because multiculturalism has worked so well that you don't have to be deeply religious, that you are going to be more happy if you're not religious. Or... Uh, uh, um, that's a possibility. What, what, I mean, how different is the UK to other countries? Just 
not just on this question, but looking at the bigger picture of, of what it means. Um, I quite like this one. I think most religious people are more sad because they think about it all the time. The worms will eat us anyway. And Mike in Birmingham says, quotes one of my favourite philosophers, he says, as Joey Tribbiani once said, there's no such thing as a selfless good deed. Did he really say that? Sounds a little bit astute. Sophisticated for the great Tribbiani. How are you doing? Tom's in Chelmsford. Tom, what would you like to say? Yeah, I've got it in front of me, the article. Um, yeah. It seems the methodology is a bit suspect. I mean, one it's, measuring a f- report. it's a radio phoning show, mate. You can't ring in and start questioning the oh. methodology. Okay, all right. All right, okay. Well, I've... But I mean, oh, I'll just say this. Did you smile or laugh a lot yesterday? Yes. Well, that's all relative, isn't it? Like, smiling or laugh a lot for me yeah. might be a lot less than it is for you, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it, it's really very subjective question. So we're cracking on with questioning the methodology then? Despite, despite no, my... No, but we'll dis- move on to that. No, I like that. No, we're in now. No. You can't be... No, we're, let's do it. Let's, yeah. let's question the methodology. Uh, measuring report is called Positive Experience Index. Did you learn or do something Did interesting you, yeah. yesterday? So you might say yes, and I might say no, but yeah. actually, yesterday, we both did exactly the same things. Exactly. Exactly, Exactly, John. yeah. You've, 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 you've struck the nail on the head but, there. Well, I have only because you handed me a hammer, Tom. That's Thank, thank you. Thank You're you very, very well. much. But isn't that not true of all kind of well-being surveys? Wouldn't yes. it? Yes. Well, no, well, you know, even, uh, well, uh, it can all shed a bit of light. I mean, it's got us talking, hasn't it? No, well, that's, the, that's, why I, that's why I sort of alluded to the context of, of a radio in terms phone. Of Britain, in terms of Britain, some say that there is, uh, we are a more secular society than any other. Yeah. Um, now, you mentioned multiculturalism. Maybe the, it goes a little bit before that to do with, like, a lot of people were abandoned the Church of England in yeah. terms of going every week, maybe... 150 years ago or whatever, um, but still got their kids baptised. I wasn't, but I mean, I'm still very much within that tradition. Right. Um, but I mean, I remember, i just say uh, in terms of a personal experience that surprised me, I remember I was having driving lessons and my driving instructor, he had to go to, he just said, oh, we just need to nip to the church because he had to like, turn off the burglar alarm or something. I can't even remember. Right. I could tell what? before even mentioning that yeah. he was, had, was part of the church of England, yeah. and this is in, in England. Yeah, he was like he, he hesitated to even mention it to me, uh, and he sort of bristled because he because he was almost expecting from me like a young person mockery. Um, uh, yeah, which wasn't you know oh, that's which interesting. Is not yeah, which is so yeah. He was which so, probably he was, wouldn't happen in other countries because that that because yeah. even with your reservations about the methodology, the question of why the UK would respond so differently from almost everywhere else would still be pertinent, wouldn't it? It would still be interesting because yeah. the methodology would be the yeah. same everywhere. So that that could be part... When did that happen then? Oh, about 15, 10... No, not the driving lesson. The, 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 oh. the, 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 the kind of... The, the, <laughs> that's my fault entirely. That's exactly what I'd have answered if it, this conversation was the other way around. Yeah, but I meant right. more the depiction... I tell you what we could blame, Tom. We could blame Monty Python. Yeah, well, I guess that was a symptom. I mean, you well, know, was it I, a I, symptom I, or was it a cause? When did that fear of mockery for being religious take hold in this country in a way that it perhaps hasn't taken hold in other countries? Well, at the, at the drop off in religion, I mean, according to someone that did a later life adult degree in history and did a dissertation in, in precisely this, yeah, the, the claims to be a Anglican Christian. But didn't have anything to do with the Anglican Church. And she said, she worked in doctor, and she said um, that it was actually to do with, um, it wasn't to do, a lot of people, there's, there's a, a narrative it's to do by the rise of science and like evolution. Yeah, but that, but and, that's not unique and, to us, is it? That wouldn't, that wouldn't explain the UK's. I mean, you're, you're talking about the Enlightenment, essentially. You're talking about 19th century continental philosophy and the sort of attempts of, philosophers like Immanuel Kant to replace religion with categorical imperatives and, and philosophical rationales for behaving altruistically and decently without recourse to a god, to a deity. I, John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham and similar territory with utilitarianism. But but that's, I mean, and that, you know, Kant was German. Mill and Bentham were Scottish. So it's not, um, it doesn't explain why the UK would be different. But that, I tell you what might, that, 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 what might is that notion of mockery. 
is 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 the United Kingdom, and I don't have fingers and enough pies to answer this question from a position of knowledge or experience, but is the United Kingdom a place where you are more likely to face mockery or criticism when you state that you're devoutly religious than you are almost anywhere else in the world? That's an interest, because then, of course, the notion of unhappiness going along with devout religion comes into a completely different light. So how, oh, I don't know, who could answer that question? Someone who is devoutly religious and has lived in lots of different places, but it's only in the UK that you feel people are smirking or sniggering when you talk about your faith. Half past 12 is the time. Lottie Morley is here with your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 33 minutes after 12 is the time you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um... Uh, yeah, this would be part of it from Jed. Being brought up in a strict Catholic school, I became happier when I lost my faith age 16 and realised I wouldn't be going to eternal hell when I died. That's got to cheer you up, hasn't it? You know, you wake up one morning, think, oh, no, I'm going to go to eternal hell when I die. Eternal damnation. And then the next day you wake up, you've lost your faith, and you think, God, oh, that's great. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be damned for all time in hell. But it doesn't explain... Well, well, <laughs> So a devoutly religious person, Jed, would have believed in eternal damnation, but lived a life that uh, uh, allowed them to avoid it. So I don't know how pertinent your particular experience is to the broader question. 12.34 is the time. The Labour Party conference in Liverpool has got underway in stark contrast to the Conservative Party conference in Manchester, where halls were empty and speeches were weird. Stand up and fight! Uh, David Lammy played a blinder yesterday, and it is Yvette Cooper's turn today to... T- uh, Rachel Reeves, extremely well-received. Uh, another little example of that. Uh, the Daily Mail claimed that Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England who endorsed Rachel Reeves' economics plans and called her a serious economist, uh, the Daily Mail was having kittens today because apparently this shattered a, a well-established convention that Bank of England governors, former Bank of England governors, never get involved in politics. And that's the same Daily Mail to which the former Bank of England governor, Mervyn King, regularly contributes political or at least political-ish articles funny that I, i'm sure it's just a sort of a, a slight oversight on the editorial floor rather than yet more examples of weapons grade hypocrisy disingenuousness and dishonesty but as i say yvette cooper has been on stage today and henry riley had a ringside seat henry what what, what, what did you make of it all Yes, good afternoon, James. It was a pretty packed uh, conference hall for Yvette Cooper's speech this morning. Uh, There was a a huge presence from Labour members, a huge presence from journalists as well, eager to find out exactly what the Shadow Home Secretary, if you're to believe the polls, potentially a future Home Secretary, has to say on a whole variety of issues. One of the key things that Yvette Cooper sought to do right from the start, and obviously you get this at a party conference whereby they're putting clear water between themselves and the Conservative Party, was to refer to what she described as Tory chaos in the Home Office. So, from Labour this week, you get serious plans to change our country. From the Tories last week, what were they on? I mean, the chaos just keeps getting worse. We have had five Tory Prime Ministers in seven years. And seven Tory Home Secretaries, two of them, Suella Braverman, literally the only person who could make you want to bring back Pretty Patel. <laughs> and conference. A Home Secretary more interested in going after Elton John than going after criminals? Well, I guess that's why they call them the Blues. Yvette Cooper there speaking, and it got a few nods when she said uh, that, you know, rather pretty Patel than Suella Braverman when you see what some of what Suella Braverman's done, which was quite surprising. You wouldn't have thought that a couple of years ago when um, pretty Patel was uh, was the Home Secretary. Um, in terms of other issues, it, violence against women and girls was a key thing that Yvette Cooper um, spoke about. She said that she wants domestic abuse experts in 999 call centres. Um, she also pledged that actually there should be uh, essentially domestic abuse experts um, and rape experts at various police forces as well, saying that far too often um, that is not the case and that is failing women and girls. She also referenced um, Suella Braverman again later on, saying we've had more Home Secretary sent to Rwanda than anyone else. But in terms of that policing in against violence against women and girls, Yvette Cooper keen to stress that rather than rhetoric, she had three concrete policies. So, conference, the next Labour government 
will put specialist rape investigation units in every force, domestic abuse experts in every 999 call centre. We will require police forces to use tactics normally reserved for organised crime or terrorist investigations to identify and go after the most dangerous repeat abusers and rapists and get them off our streets. And that alludes to one of Labour's five missions that Sir Keir Starmer set out at the start of the year. Safe streets, stronger policing is one of those, so a bit more meat on the bone when it comes to that. Also, um, perhaps not surprisingly, Yvette Cooper evoked Tony Blair at one point, saying that we need to be tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, which again got a rapturous applause amongst the delegates at the conference hall. <laughs> so a, 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 an ebullient atmosphere, I think. Yeah, I mean, right, you can probably hear there is a, a huge queue from the conference centre that's snaked all the way past the LBC Global stand. It is huge. And again, when I was there this morning, Emily Thornbury kicked things off at the main uh, stand at 9.50. And there were people there who I was asking what they were looking forward to hearing Emily Thornbury talk about. And they said, oh, no, we're, we're reserving our seats for Keir Starmer. One, one person said, um, it's like when you're on holiday and you put your beach towels on a deck chair to try and reserve it for the day. Um, so they, they, even though Keir Starmer doesn't and start speaking until two o'clock people there ready to go and sort of getting in but the the slight blow to them was they've been told they have to do a sweep before a police sweep before the uh, actual speech and so they've all been kicked out of their seats that they were they had thought they had reserved for Sir Keir Starmer speech so they're back in the queue but they're pretty high up the queue and uh, I sense they're determined to get themselves a seat and how much pressure is on him I mean he's it, a very different situation from Rishi Sunak it, 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 they're sort of going into conference on, on on a winning streak as opposed to a long uh, record of losses or, or or draws so he's not he's not expected to pull anything out of his hat today but but delegates would expect to see a, 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 a substantive speech as well as a competent one yeah, and I think, look, Sir Keir Starmer's very clear, actually, and very uh, he sort of recognises the fact that whilst there is a, an anti-conservative sentiment at the moment, if you look at polling, that hasn't necessarily, although, of course, there was a Rutherglen by-election, but it was extremely low turnout, it hasn't actually transformed necessarily into core Labour voters. And so what he needs to do today, yes, he needs to address party delegates who are, of course, looking forward to hearing from their leader, but really, like Rachel Reeves did yesterday, a lot of it's going to be looking down the barrel of the camera, speaking directly directly to the British people. So in terms of party members, there'll be a lot of policy, but really what he has got to do today is set aside those people who are disillusioned with the Conservatives mm. and make sure they're not wavering. They are definitely going to the Labour Party. And really as well, if you, if you speak to sources close to Sir Keir Starmer, it's the five missions that I referenced earlier. There, there was an acceptance, I have to say, um, from, from people within the Labour Party that they haven't necessarily cut through those five missions or that they haven't perhaps played them up enough as they should do. Um, whatever you think of Rishi Sunak, they were sort of on the tip of people's tongues because he mentions them every answer in an interview. Sakir hasn't done that, and so he's going to turn those missions into more sort of policy statements. And I think you'll have a far more tangible goal from Sakir Starmer when it comes to growth, when it comes to safer streets, rather than them just being missions. He's going to turn them into policy objectives. And in terms of tomorrow's front pages, will, will there be a sort of humdinger of, a, of an announcement that nobody is expecting and that is perhaps in addition to the, the firming up of the five pledges. Humdinger is a technical political term, Henry. I don't know if you've come across it before. Thank you. I, I put it in my vocabulary yes, list. Um, but no, I, I think look, the, there, was, there was a story reported today about the sort of towns, that's, the new towns that Sir Keir Starmer um, is very keen to push. That is obviously out there already. If you speak to allies close to Sir Keir Starmer, they will say, wait and see. They're being very tight-lipped in terms of what is in the speech. They don't want anything to leak out. So um, in terms of that humdinger, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait until two o'clock James but um, there you know you never know with these speeches he's going to be speaking for, for a considerable period of time perhaps close to an hour um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of substance in there that no doubt will make it onto the front pages and so we shall we shall watch with interest I, I mean crikey I, I, I you know I've interviewed Keir Starmer the idea of people queuing around the queuing around the block is certainly novel isn't it he's rock star here he's <laughs> honestly there are there are there are a huge swathe of people waiting to get in people are already waiting there's a few screens around the corner as well where some of the other business stands are and there are people waiting there as well so they can sort of have their view of the screen unimpeded so um, yeah a bit of a bit of a rock atmosphere no, I shouldn't here say at bizarre Conference. I mean there, there, there is an air of, 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 of change in the air and in fact I think they've, they've 
not there's no triumphalism that I've detected, albeit that I'm a few hundred miles away. You're, I, triumphalism is not a word I would apply, but 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 boundless optimism. And actually, you know, Rachel Reeves yesterday, David Lammy yesterday, Yvette Cooper, not just looking like a government in waiting, but but believing, I think, that they are a government in waiting. Yes, and I was speaking with Darren Jones this morning, who, to remind your listeners, is the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury. He is, he is a very, very impressive politician. Very impressive. He, he impressed when he was chair of the Business Committee. Mm. Um, and he, I mean, I was asking him this morning, sort of somewhat teasing him, saying, oh, yeah, what are we expecting in the speech? Must be looking up for, for the Labour Party at the moment. And they are not, I mean, they are far from complacent. They really know that the, the deal is not done. The, the sort of dotted line has not been signed. They're very clear that actually they realise, what I was saying earlier, really, James, that there is this anti-conservative sentiment but that they haven't necessarily got over the line yet they don't take these yeah. by-elections for granted there's two more key ones coming up but really Rutherglen they will see as a turning point but they're not going to stop me the messaging they're not going to stop going out there and as they would see it putting out their policies exposing the conservatives and I think that's a, that's certainly something Sir Keir Starmer has brought to the party and um, he's very determined to, to not be complacent to really sell the message and you get the sense he's going to stop at nothing to keep doing that before the next election so I'm Josh Sheila, no doubt taking that live from two. Henry Riley, many thanks indeed for your um, your sort of pre-match analysis, as it were, and uh, you'll be able to listen to that speech in full, as indeed you could listen to Rishi Sunak's speech in full uh, on this radio station, not this programme. Uh, Keir Starmer's speech will be on Sheila's programme. Rishi Sunak's speech was on this programme, but it was so long it actually extended into Sheila's programme. And as we've established earlier today, it didn't need to be that long because a lot of the things he read out weren't actually prompt promises, pledges or policies at all. They were just illustrations. I don't know if you missed that bit of today's show. It's, to me, genuinely staggering that it turns out that long list of things he read out. And we'll build this, and we can build this, and we can build this, and we will build that. Turns out that's not what he was saying at all. He was just saying, no, we can build things like this. There will be a tram from Kidderminster to Timbuktu. So everyone in Kidderminster is going, wow, that's amazing. Everyone in Timbuktu is going, oh, I don't know about that. Have you seen the state of some of those people in Kiddy? But it turns out that that was just an illustration of the kind of thing that they could build. 12.45 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.48 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where the conversation has taken a slightly unusual turn. Um, uh, uh, well, I mean, it hasn't. It's a, a conversation we intended to have from 12 o'clock, but it's uh, in, in rather stark and welcome contrast to the gravity of conversations about the Middle East and, and uh, recent events in Israel. And oddly, given that we spent four hours talking about recent events in Israel since the beginning of this week, we barely mentioned religion at all. Uh, but we're mentioning it now because non-religious people in the UK have a more positive experience of life and enjoy stronger social networks than those with a deep faith, which is interesting in and of itself. But to me, at least, it's even more interesting when you add in the fact that <clears throat> it puts us in this country at odds with almost the rest of the world, certainly with a global trend where the reverse is usually true. So why would the UK be bucking this global trend? And, um, and why would... Uh, non-religious people be happier than religious people? I'm not sure you can answer both questions consistently because one would almost make a mockery of, of the other. 0345 6060973. Mick's in Gateshead. Mick, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I'm just trying to give my own perspective, which is the perspective of an atheist on this. Yes, of course. Um, and my, uh, this might sound rather simple or flippant, but my, my viewpoint is... I have a concept of, or I don't particularly believe in heaven or hell, so I don't actually worry about which one I may or may not be going, going to. Okay. Yeah, but so if I, you I were going to heaven, if you were definitely going to heaven, then you'd be a right happy little bunny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's, this, this is a much more generic thing, but whenever they do these surveys of sort of countries, where, which are the happiest countries, yes. I think you, you, you'll normally find the top 10 always has the Scandinavian countries in it. Yes, it does. Which, which, which are generally considered atheist or agnostic or whatever it is. Obviously, I'm 62. I've never been a religious person. Like you said, you said earlier on, you've gone through different phases where you might have had a kind of a bit of a religious experience and then you kind of came out of it. Not a religious experience. You make it sound like I saw angels. I've just I've derived enormous comfort from going to church at various times in my life. And I've gone through periods of, of, of having faith and not having faith. But I don't think I can track my happiness according to whether I'm 
believing at the time or not. It's it's. <laughs> But what you don't have is is what I grew up with, which was Catholic guilt. You know, everything. Yeah, I was from... just I was just about to say that because my we, wife we is actually a Catholic, and I've actually said that to her many times. I don't have your guilt, Chief. I don't feel guilty about. <laughs> How does she lying. greet this? How does she <laughs> welcome this insight into your different um, experiences? Uh, it's it, it's a very it's a very interesting topic as you make the match. <laughs> yes, I can I can imagine. I mean because you should I mean you, you must have guilt in some context if you do something wrong. I, I mean, you know, if you if you stole a biscuit or something or, or or if you cheated on your wife, I'm not for a minute suggesting that you have, then there would be guilt there, but it wouldn't be guilt born of religious indoctrination. Yeah, exactly. What what I'm saying is I'm a moral person. I class myself as a moral person. Yes. I don't go I don't go around robbing people and stuff like that. I I, I class that as human nature, if you know what I mean. I, do. I think that that's what that's what you should be indoctrinated with. I don't think you should be religiously indoctrinated. Yeah, just be excellent. Well, that's what Bill and Ted thing. said, Mick. Bill and Ted said, be excellent to each other. Yeah. yeah. You don't, you don't yeah. need a deity or a, or a, a omniscient, omnipotent power to, to endorse that mode of living. I, I've always thought be excellent to each other would be a wonderful motto for humanity itself. But hey-ho, we're a long way off that. Um, I, 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 quite a lot going on here with the... Um, specific nature of the uk i don't know that we've got there when you lose faith says ollie in oxford you gain agency over your life when you achieve things you achieve them through your own hard work and not because you've been blessed or because you prayed half hard enough this gives you an increased feeling of joy and pride in yourself you feel a sense of real achievement and not a sense of having to be grateful to something else for your own hard work on the flip side when things go wrong um, it may be in your hands to change it or it may just be bad luck, but it's not because God is punishing you or not answering your prayers. That's a clever point, Ollie. I, I sometimes balk a bit when sports people thank God for their victory because I don't know whether or not there's a sort of philosophical response to this, but it sounds as if you're suggesting that God wanted everyone else to lose. So, you know, imagine you come last in a race... And the winner thanks God. It's bad enough you came last. Now you've got to deal with the fact that for reasons completely beyond your comprehension, God wanted you to come last. As what? As a punishment for something? And the people who came first are going to somehow, by dint of being the fastest runner in a race, have got some sort of claim to a superior moral compass? I don't know. Amar is in Hackney. Amar, what would you like to say? Amar. Hi, James. How's Hello. it going? You all right? Very well, mate. What's on your mind? So basically, what I just wanted to cover a few points. Um, Western society was built on the foundations of the Bible. Now, I'm talking from an ex-Muslim, now Christian point of view. Oh, wow. um, if you go back in history, right, love your neighbors, yourself, all of these different points, this is what gave us the democracy in Western society, you know? Yes. If you look at the Western world and all of the Christian countries, there's democracy, there's peace, you know, and well, there is now, but I mean, there wasn't ninety years ago. Yeah, well, look, there's. there's I am looking. Right? It's, so you're a broad yeah. sweep of the Christian era, which would say, give or take, is two thousand years. But you I'm, could look at it two different ways, James. Right? Well, you could look at it right. through the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church point of view of Christianity, yeah, right? which is, as we know, Inquisition has a lot of things. I don't want to discuss it and go deep into it but there was a Sorry? lot of things that happened that wasn't right and that pushed a lot of people away from christ yeah um, okay then you have the other path which is the you know the true path of the faith where people wasn't burnt because they had a bible or wasn't punished or put into cells and dungeons and things like that yeah so what i wanted to kind of get into was people when they don't have to follow too many rules, they're generally going to be more happier. Yeah? And well, no, no, because in in almost every country except the UK, it's the devoutly religious people report being happier than the non-religious people. Yeah, but this is where I was, uh, this is where I was going to complete the whole... Um, Go on, then. ...sentence that I was saying. So, in general, yeah. right, people that don't follow too many rules seem happier. So when you see them outside, they seem happier. But when you look at it deeply, me being a Christian and finding my faith has given me joy. Good. I've seen miracles take place. Oh, I've got I've got inner peace, James. Good. And this this peace that I've got, I can't explain it to you, but it's it's a sound mind, James. And 
I didn't have this with my previous faith. I'm not saying there's yeah, anything I'm, wrong I'm, with that faith. I'm genuine, I'm, I am okay. genuinely very, very, very happy for you. Genuinely. Thank you, man. I've even, you know, I've got, Respect I've got a channel, I don't want to mention it, it's on a famous place where you upload videos. and But okay. I'm, I'm literally seeing people's lives change, people that were suffering. But you're not, you're not answering you know? the question of why non-religious people are generally happier than religious people, though. Well, what, is that just in the UK? Yeah. Yeah, well, when you look at it, Right, they're happier because they don't have to um, follow the rules of what God mentioned. If you look at people now, no religious people, some of them could be the worst neighbors you could ever wish for. But if you have someone who's Christian or Muslim, something like that, or a Hindu, or someone who's kind of religious, you know that these people have morals, you know, and these morals have come down from generation to generation. And well, you know, you know if that, if that, if, yeah. I, I mean, I, I you make some excellent points, I, and uh, I mean, you're describing people who are truly observation, truly observing the teachings of whatever religion it is they follow, rather than people who are just wearing a badge, which is part of the problem in politics with people claiming to be devout Catholics while being obviously in favour of sending children up chimneys. Uh, not mentioning any names, but the the the, the, the difference as a cause in the context of Christianity, which is the religion I know best, living by Christ's teachings is a is a recipe for um, epic altruism and and, and and decency, and I'm sure the same is true in other religions. But I don't, don't know why it would make you happier the other way around. Uh, thank you, uh, Amar. Last word on this to Tom, who's in Folkestone. I can only give you a minute, Tom, but make it good. All right. Uh, hi, James. Sure. Well, I'll make it very quick then. Um, I'm the kind of person who is uh, believing in God, but does not believe in religion. Because uh, okay. I believe in God, I believe in his uh, moral values and teachings. I don't believe in restricting myself. But his teachings are religious. I mean, it, his teachings are religious. Sorry, I mean, I've possibly been a bit pedantic on the semantics here, but, but it, 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 God's perceived teachings, that's what a religion is. Yeah, but I feel I, I feel generally happy with life because I don't think, uh, you know, I force myself to go to church. I don't, uh, you know, fast uh, when when it's time for fasting. Yeah, uh, it's 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 restrictive for me. It feels like religion is a, is a set of rules, like the previous caller said. Uh, it, so you you, it, can't, you try to be a good person, try to treat yeah, but, treat but, others as you would like to be treated yourself. But I don't need all the bells exactly, and smells yes. that go with it and also very quickly on the point why we are so different here in the uk uh well my girlfriend is actually from philippines and she still lives there and i've been traveling a lot to other countries yes. as well uh, what i've realized is in any other country one single religion is uh majorly embodied into everyday life so, so everyone people. feels part of the i said I, I did warn you we didn't have much time tom so i'm sorry that i'm c cutting you off in your prime but that, then everyone feels part of the same community religion equals community in, in 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 those kind of countries but not in all countries thank you mate uh, Dominus Vobiscum. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, Rewind Live Radio, or enjoy the whole show podcast. You'll also find all of LBC shows there to catch up on, as well as um, you can stay up to date with the latest news from LBC. Rewind Live Radio on Global Player. Download for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. Thanks very much, James. James O'Brien on LBC.